Coming up next, The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy. Every Thursday from 4 p.m. right here on RCR. Reality Check Radio. People are struggling to have conversations and connect with others that they don't completely agree with on every topic. And I think that's probably the biggest problem that we need to try and solve is how after all this division and after all this separation, do we end up bringing people together again? And what does unity really look like? New Zealand faces some pretty big issues. First one is COVID in the aftermath. There's no getting away from that. Second is racial division. It's being ginned up and it's dangerous. Another issue that maybe people haven't got their head around yet is digital currency. What form does that take? Is it programmable? Will it be used to manipulate behaviour and patterns of behaviour? Those questions need to be asked and answered. How can you have fair, open, democratic government by people who are appointed? It's a ridiculous idea. And if that idea is taken to its zenith, then this country is in real trouble because democracy, one person, one vote, where every vote is of equal value, has got to be the foundation of a modern New Zealand. What's true, what's not true, how our kids are to be educated. And, you know, I have a great fear for the future. I think we know from history where this could end up. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy, right here on RCR. Welcome to The Crunch on Reality Check Radio. I'm your host, Cam Slater, and this is the place we crunch the political issues and cut through the politician's spin. It's my birthday today, and we've got an interesting show ahead of you as well with a focus on Auckland Council. My first guest this afternoon is Ken Turner from the Waitakere Ward. He's trained as a mechanic and is struggling against the bureaucracy to see common sense policies prevail. We'll discuss these frustrations so you can better see the mess Auckland is in. And then I'll be talking with another councillor, my good mate Greg Sayers. His issues are similar to what Ken Turner is dealing with, but also slightly different rural-focused issues in Rodney. Of course, we'll dip into the mailbag, and then it'll be a time for a chat with my buddies to find out their thoughts about why New Zealand has become a nation of sissies and bigots. Don't forget to send comments to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Today's my birthday. I've been around for 55 years today. I was born in Fiji, but have lived most of my life in New Zealand. And what I'm seeing in New Zealand today leaves me shaking my head in sadness. It seems we've gone from being a strong and resilient can-do nation to a nation of sissies and bigots, always finding reasons not to do things and bitterly complaining about almost everything to pathetically surrendering our own personal autonomy to an increasingly nanny-ish state. We've done amazing things as Kiwis. From Ernest Rutherford, who was a pioneering researcher in both atomic and nuclear physics. Rutherford's been described as the father of nuclear physics and the greatest experimentalist since Michael Faraday. To Richard Pierce, who reportedly beat the Wright brothers to the first flight by a human. And then we look at Bill Hamilton, who invented the Hamilton jet engine, and Bill Gallagher, who popularized the electric fence. And we mustn't forget John Britton, who was a mechanical engineer who designed a world record-setting motorcycle. And of course, there's the prowess of Fisher and Paykel and numerous other inventors, scientists, and innovators. We lead the world in agricultural innovation and farming. There literally isn't anything that Kiwis can't do if we turn our minds to it. And yet we seem to have beggared ourselves intellectually, physically, and societally. I visited Israel in 2014 and saw that same ingenuity and resourcefulness that means that they lead the world in innovation and technology. Many of the everyday tech items you use today 
as a result of ingenious Israeli inventions. I saw many similarities between New Zealand and Israel, including being forced by necessity, in the case of New Zealand, by the tyranny of distance, and in the case of Israel, by bigoted geopolitical situations, to invent things for ourselves. But what on earth has happened to New Zealand in a few short years? Well, let me give you some examples so you can catch up with my thinking. During the Women's Football World Cup recently held in Auckland, there was a fire alarm at Eden Park during an important game. It was a false alarm, but what did our media feature on television? That's right, a pathetic half-man, whining that there was no one to tell him what to do as the alarms rang out across the stadium. I mean, seriously, that was his concern? Not having anyone around to tell him what to do? It presumably never occurred to this feeble human that perhaps he should look after himself and those around him in his care. It never occurred to him to maybe, oh, I don't know, have a look around and see if he could spot any smoke or general alarm from others and then plan egress by any means necessary in case there really was an emergency. Nope, none of that. Just a whiny moan to the media that there was no one to tell him what to do. How he managed to attain adulthood and then breed is beyond my comprehension. Presumably, he still calls his mummy every day to ask what colour socks and undies he needs to wear. It's pathetic, but wait, there's more. There's the endless parade of morons who have been dudded hundreds of thousands of dollars in various scams, all who appear exceptionally stupid. And you really do have to wonder how they ever amassed the hundreds of thousands of dollars in the first place in order to then willingly hand it all over to whatever Nigerian princess who comes along and tells them they need their help to repatriate millions of dollars that's just resting in a foreign country. If only the poor idiot would pay this fee or that fee. They're greedily chasing a percentage of the repatriated funds. How did they become so stupid? And then there was one the other day in the media, some guy from Kerry Kerry who's lost $400,000. There he was parading his stupidity to the media and moaning about the bank or somebody should have stopped him. And then what do we find out? Yes, that the bank actually raised these issues with him several times as he plowed good money after bad, chasing the elusive win. He ignored all the warnings, told the bank it was all legit, and is now blaming the bank for his losses. And these stories are presented almost every week. It's always someone else's fault. They always want something to be done, usually by the government, to fix the problem. All without first identifying that the government can't fix stupidity. But you know what? I actually think that our governments, of all kinds and flavours, are actually to blame. And here's why. We've conditioned our citizens to expect the government to solve each and every ill or complaint in society. We've had intergenerational welfareism in order to help the poor. How's that worked out for us? We've had intergenerational subsidies in varying forms to help farmers or manufacturers or industry or families, etc., etc. It goes on and on. There's always someone with their hand out for government money. How's that worked out for us? We've mollycoddled our society to such an extent that grown adults can't work out what to do in a fire alarm or fall for stupid confidence tricks. And I blame the politicians. Ronald Reagan said it best. The nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And you know what? He's right. The last four years highlight this exact problem. We let our government lock us down, lock us up, mandate experimental medicines, brainwash us to such an extent that even today fools drive around in their cars by themselves wearing masks. When the government says they're here to help, start slowly backing out of the room. They aren't in it for us. They knew the vaccines were neither safe nor effective, yet they brainwashed us, then forced us to take them. Many of us, though, especially RCR listeners, didn't succumb to the brainwashing, and we actually and literally fought the mandates. Sadly, though, that was just 10% of us. The rest dutifully believed that the government was there to help us, to protect us. And the media were holding hands with the government too. Instead of being a bulwark against government excesses, they took the cash and became their handmaidens. Little wonder then that we no longer trust them. 
And the same goes for the increasing bigotry in our society, where even the mere hint of a referendum on the Treaty of Waitangi is met with warnings of violence, where elected councillors are blackmailed and threatened because they didn't vote in favour of Maori wards, and where Maori politicians decry democracy, calling it the tyranny of the majority and hanker for their kind of democracy, where they get to dictate what we say, do and think. And the media are all in on it as well. From the policing of pronouns, microaggressions, and the push for re indigenization and decolonization of our society, all these do is just sow the seeds of discord and division. But that's what they want when they do it. And it saddens me that New Zealand has become a nation of sissies and bigots. It's up to us to have these courageous discussions. And that's why Reality Check Radio was formed to challenge the narrative to be the true fourth estate, and to have courageous discussions without fear or favour. And that's why I view my job here as so vitally important. I'm doing this for society because someone has to. And that's why you're listening now, because you respect those same ideals, even though we may disagree on some of the finer details. We need, and now I'm going to steal the language of the World Economic Forum, to build back better. Not in the way they want, but in the way we need. We need to build back the resilience, the can-do attitude, the belief in ourselves to make better Kiwis, stronger, smarter, and undefeatable. The same attitudes that saw totalitarians quake in fear when the Maori battalion or Kiwi troops were deployed on a battlefield. We have the people and the wherewithal to be the best at whatever we want to be. If only we'd just do things like we did in the past. I'm up for the challenge. Are you? Want an easier way to listen to RCR? Well, you can now download the brand new Reality Check Radio app, both on iOS and Android. We've completed our beta testing, and the app is now live. You can visit the App Store's direct or find out all you need to know at www.realitycheck.radio forward slash app. That's at realitycheck.radio forward slash app. Our test bunnies have been hard at play to ensure you have access to everything, from listening to our live broadcast, downloading some of our incredible interviews, and checking out the latest blogs all from the very same app. So get listening and download the RCR app now. Ken Turner is the Waitakere Ward Councillor. He's a mechanic and therefore a practical guy seeking practical solutions to many of the problems currently besetting Auckland. He's on the line to discuss some of his frustrations and battles with the bureaucrats. Ken Turner, welcome to The Crunch. Good morning. I'm glad to be here. Well, Ken, you're probably wondering why I'm calling you and uh, having a conversation. I've got to say it's because I get mail or email and text messages every week and people suggest guests for the show. Somebody sent me a, a message last week saying, could I recommend Ken Turner as a guest? West Auckland councillor, he'll have a story of wanton waste for you. He is battling the bureaucrats for us let alone what's happening out west. So that's why you're on the crunch today. Very good. <laughs> so you've obviously got a few fans out west. I note that you uh, are a mechanic by trade. That makes you a practical person. Are you looking to provide some practical solutions uh, in your term in Auckland Council? Yes, a- absolutely. That's what made me stand in the very beginning, clean the drains and fix the potholes. And I still wear my overalls as often as I can. They, uh, they're, they're my comfort zone. I was 57 before I um, started trying to be political. And I suppose the driver was. I, I looked at council's actions and policies and thought, why the hell would you do that? Or what is the common sense in that? Yeah, I mean, this is the refrain that we're getting a lot. I mean, I have on, on the... Uh, on each show every week, um, uh, Cam's Buddies, where I call up some mates and they give me five minutes or 10 minutes of their thoughts for the day. Uh, last week, we were talking about uh, Auckland Council and the new mayor and a year later and where we're at. And uh, they expressed you know, extreme frustration that a lot of the promises in the past and, and in the, even in the past year uh, seem to fall on deaf ears. It's like ratepayers are treated as 
uh, wallets or pockets to be picked by the council. Um, it may not be the councillors. Certainly, it is the governing body that is making the decisions, but it's the council officers, the, the civil servants, so to speak, that are spending what many people think is frivolous uh, wastes of money. A, a good example would be these raised bumps on almost every pedestrian crossing that's appeared in Auckland. So, you know, are you looking at battling that? And, and is it difficult in the council to constantly fight these bureaucrats who are dreaming up new ways to spend our money? Well, let's just break it down to the fact that we're all human and the place is full of people. And, um, hmm. um, you know, I promised the people who voted for me that I would not be one of those councillors who begs for their vote uh, at election time and then immediately turns 180 and regurgitates council spin back to them. And and, and I'm certainly trying to, and I'm sticking to that. But I also now get a, a, a feel and an understanding and observation of the system. Mm. And, you know, as soon as I was elected and started on my um, on my campaign of being honest, <laughs> if, if that's the word for it, I was well massaged by the bureaucracy to keep me in line, including the fact that I was it was shown to me that when I signed the, my um, when I was sworn in, I, I signed that I was now part of council and statutorily I am now part of council, even though uh, your stipend is paid as a contractor. Mm. And um, I, it took me a little while to find get my feet under the table and turn around and say, well, yeah, maybe that's technically, you know, legally true, but the public set my job description and that's who I will be uh, responding to. And that's the job description I will be following. There's a lot of good people in there wanting to do their job. Uh, in fact, most of them, but the machine just takes over a systemic failure. And so I, I get a lot of my information um, from insiders um, so yeah, uh, it, it's it's. I think it's the timeframes that has shocked me. Um, I'm glad I didn't start this any earlier in life, but then on the other hand, I should have done because um, this whole thing works in a glacially slow speeds. Um, I've I've had some wins and been very happy, but the potholes are gaining on me. <laughs> well, that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, most people think that councils should provide basic essentials for to keep a city operating. That removal of waste, reticulation of water, uh, fixing the roads, all of those sorts of things. But we've seen this explosion of multicolored cycleways. We've got outside my apartment in Takapuna here, you know, we had two nights where the council or the contractors to the council went and painted this big red stripe across the road and marked it with 30 kilometers an hour. Not a single person I've spoken to in Takapuna ever asked for the roads around Takapuna to be set to 30 kilometres an hour. We've got vast swathes of roads, particularly in the rural areas, where the speed limit's been dropped from 100 to 80 and sometimes even 60 kilometres an hour. Nobody asked for this. So how does this happen? How do these things occur when nobody actually asked for it? So it's an ideology, and you know I'm I'm looking everywhere for practical explanations, so is the public. Mm. Um, and when what they're told to be the truth and what they observe is, is, is the truth is so far apart, it becomes very unsettling, which is which is half of all the sort of, of problem out there. And it's not just council. It's, it's also, well, it's government-driven or has been for some time. Mm. Um, it's these big campaign messages, uh, zero deaths by 2050. It's impossible. It's, it's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. But that allows a whole bunch of um, subtitles to uh, start to take uh, life and take all the funding. So it, it was very interesting on the local board. Uh, the, the local board, um, to a degree, had more constraints, and so for, therefore you had to be uh, more targeted in what you wanted to spend on. Um, the governing body, just in being the governing body, we seem to have that higher level view. So, man, can we waste some money, um, what they call it, optioneering, and, um, you know, sort of just trying to, to – well, it, I'm struggling for words because – the process is is um, 
wasteful, I, I suppose is what I should say. The, 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 I have seen many project prices where the, the actual construction of whatever the, the asset is is under 50% of the total bill. In fact, I haven't been shown one, and they're in the tens. I haven't been shown one yet where the construction price was anything like the full the full bill. Mm. I mean, you know, yesterday I was uh, out, out in Manukau, and, uh, you know, I used to, not many people know this, but I used to run a crew uh, when Manukau City Council was around clearing drains, uh, maintaining parks, doing all those sorts of things. And I, I look on how we did things back then. It was a f- few years ago now, but it's it's not more than 20 years. And, uh, you know, I was watching these guys on the side of the road clearing the sumps, you know, with those grates that are on the side of the road. We used to drive up with a – yeah, cesspits. We used to drive up with a sucker truck. Our guy would jump out, lift the grate, stick the tube down, suck all the guts out of the thing, put the grate back down, drive on. Well, what I saw yesterday in Manukau, same zone, same drain cesspits that we used to (coughs) drill, he had a truck. He had a another little ute in front with a little sign on it saying, warning, men working. Uh, there's another little ute behind him. There was an STMS person. There was cones for Africa, like more cones than, than Ned Kelly. Um, you know, they were everywhere, all to drain a sump, which normally would take about 30 seconds to a minute each time. But because of this... They were having to set the cones at each sump and then set the the traffic management and do all of this sort of nonsense. I was sitting there thinking, I said to my mate who used to run this this crew with me, look, look at this. We, we never used to do that. And I think that's an example of uh, out of control rules and regulations that somebody's dreamed up to say, let's make this safer. But how many people who were sucking sumps ever got run over by a car? Well, like it had been none. I mean, you have to hit a truck first, <laughs> you know, to get us. The first thing that comes to mind is, and there's a lot of people going to have to ride push bikes to offset the carbon from that. And I'm saying that to council all the time when I'm in the meetings. I'm trying to, we, we just seem to be one big contradiction. But the other thing is, well, there's, there's so many things in each one of, of these situations. If you stand in the middle of the road and and look down the road and view it in cross section, Mm. the tarmac carriageway is any water on that, stormwater on that, is the concern of Auckland Transport. And the cesspit and the first pipe discharging from the cesspit. Any subsequent pipe after that is then the responsibility of uh, healthy waters. So the two people who are going to maintain the system, ownership changes halfway under the road because the pipe's usually running to the downhill side. Then any leaf litter that's sitting on top of the um, cesspit is um, community facilities responsibility. Mm. And uh, if the water that is causing problems, say we've got some flooding issue or something like that, drainage issue, if the water is deemed to be coming from the environment towards the road rather than th- from the environment from the road back towards the gutters, and then it's deemed to be deemed to be a council. I don't know whether that's community facilities, healthy waters, or so. When you see a bunch of of um, a jerkins standing on the side of the road, they're really just ever debating who's going to pay. Mm. It's a bureau- bureaucratic nightmare. We are swimming in information for every person doing. A simple job, some might say a dummy's job, but dummies can't do them. If, uh, if you did right there <laughs> for every person doing that job, there are 10 people uh, riding on their back, measuring, monitoring, and uh, analyzing their every action. And that is an employment tsunami in itself. It's also where all the money goes and it achieves nothing. And you talk about you know, I actually put up a post, maybe why the nice person sent you my name. On the Huia Road, 22 kilometres, I saw one man with a little pointy pickup stick so he didn't have to bend his back picking up litter with two vehicles in front of him and two vehicle, oh, sorry, one vehicle behind him, and they went both directions on that road. The carbon emissions, the cost. And then you go home, then, then I live at the end of that road, then you go home during the weekend, 
and here's a good couple of locals taking a stroll with a bag in their hands, picking up rubbish as they go. It's just insane stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, we used to fix potholes and roads and especially in the parks. And so I know a little bit about how roads are constructed and how they're repaired. And I drive around and I look at these so-called repairs and they're quick and dirty, but they don't meet the transit specifications that we were marked and monitored and and, and controlled on. So, like you know, you'll see them drive up, you know, four or five trucks to fill a pothole and you'll see them dump a couple of shovelfuls of hot mix into the thing, tamp it down and drive off. And you sit there and you think, well, well, where's the crack ceiling? Where's the stopping of the ingress of water into the, because what, what, what people don't know is that potholes and roads and, you know, massive issues with roads are not caused by the vehicles on the roads. They're caused by water getting into the surface of the, of the road. And so you have to seal the cracks. Well, crack ceiling is a cost-effective way of putting off having to do massive dig-outs and potholes and things like that, but it doesn't seem to be any of that. Uh, you know, there's some key roads around, again, around here in Takapuna because I see them. They've got crocodile cracking happening. The roads are slumping because the water's getting underneath the surface. The potholes are emerging, and now they're just digging up a whole road. Well, a dig-out and replacing the entire surface is a whole level of expense far greater than going around and crack sealing or doing small pothole repairs. But it seems there's no, it's like the money hasn't been spent on preventative maintenance, which means that we're spending a vast amount more on remedial maintenance. Yeah, we've lost sight of reality and we have lost a generation of experience in our contracting entities. Mm -hmm. But let's just let's just go to where this big picture, this big thinking rubbish causes all these problems. Here's a, um, a piece that I've been working on and, and try, you know, uh, examples of savings. Uh, multi-million dollar savings have been ratified across uh, 12 projects. The total value of the projects is X um, and the 22% savings has been made. Three projects have embedded carbon savings of 65% with one at 100% e.g. build nothing. All projects have health and safety reductions from building nothing to building less to building differently. The only thing there that is a health and safety savings is building differently. They're talking themselves into a corner with zero carbon by 2050, um, zero road deaths, we've said by, you know, it it just, it's... um, Bollocks? Yes, it's absolute bollocks. And, you know, that's like me saying, I've got a, in my little mechanical business, the, the staff, my good people run it like their own these days. And that's how come I'm spare for this sort of stuff. But it's like me saying to them, okay, well, it's a 24 hour day and you only work for eight. I've sent you home for 16. So that's 16 hours that um, you're no longer exposed to my health and safety risk. So uh, we've got, uh, we're down to uh, 33% already. Boy, we've met our targets. And that, what happens is that trickles down to the core services. So in West Auckland, where I am, the contractor there has just uh, September a year ago, was given a $220 million base contract for five years. And then there's other stuff on top of that. I have tried to get their contracts through my support staff and things because I was looking for what you were looking for. I was looking for the key performance indicators. I was looking yeah. to see how we judge those potholes. And uh, if if the key performance indicator is only so many hot, hot potholes per 100 meters or something, uh, how we measure it, because I was suspicious, like you have just said, that as long as the road surface is level without a hollow in it, it complies you know Mm. all i've been given so far is two parts of the contract which are extremely heavy reading and it's all just waffle full of ideology and no specification yeah and and that 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 seems to be what i'm running into all the time yeah, I mean, it seems that, I mean, we thought it was bad when we were doing it with Manukau City Council. Uh, you know, they put the tender out for the job for fixing the potholes and the roads and draining the sumps and the cesspits and, you know, getting rid of leaf litter and all of that sort of clearing. This was the funniest one, right? Clearing boat ramps of sand. 
Like you go, you go out there. You, you've got a contract that says you have to have the the boat ramps clear of sand. You go out there uh, because somebody's called up because there's a you know a whole lot of sand on the thing. You you get out there with all your guys. You clear it in about two or three hours. Then the tide comes in and guess where the sand is. Right, it's back on the back on the thing. But they would come out and mark it a week later and go, oh, that's a fail because there's sand on the boat ramp. So they had auditors that would come around and do these things and check on stuff weeks, sometimes months later, when you've had 57 tides go through the place. It was just insane, the level of expenditure of ancillary staff to grade the contractor. And we were watching what other contractors were doing, and it was like they were ignoring it. They just didn't care because they knew that when it came around, if they got a failure on a pothole or something like that, they'd go, oh, well, you know, it's three months ago that we did that job. Of course, it's going to fail. A pothole's a temporary um, solution. We need to do a big dig out there. And then they would do that and, get, and build the council for even more. It was nuts. Look, this goes down to outcomes-based. Mm. Our maintenance system has got a new uh, policy, and it's called outcomes-based. Now, in reality, that means that rather going around on a regular pattern – they just turn up to anyone who complains or, or requests for service, as they say, which means another name, new fancy name for a complaint. Yeah. So in reality, it's a breakdown service and a bad one at that. Self-monitored, it, it's almost unexplainable and certainly it's irrational. And, you know, with our floods, et cetera, um, yes, we have had some extraordinary amounts of rain. Mm. Um, uh, I, I don't think unprecedented in my lifetime. I can remember when I was about six or seven, the one in our valley. But the drains need better maintenance. Yeah. Um, the, the, the rivers need maintenance. You can't just say, oh, we're going to turn this into an SEA, a significant ecological area. You can't just say we're going to turn this into an SEA. We're going to use best environmental practice, plant up beside the creek and walk away. Not in an urban area. Mm. Um, you know, spray and walk away seems to be our policies where we we go to so much trouble to initiate process yep. and then we walk away. Yeah. They start the process, they have meetings, they have a you know meeting here and a meeting there, and there's a copious amount of trees slayed to produce the paper for the minutes for the meeting and all of the so-called outcomes, but nothing actually gets done. Well, 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 we uh, there's a guy I know well, lives in my area, and he was a pig culler. Um, he started off as a pig hunter, and then they closed up the Waitakere's, so he got himself a, a culling job, and he was oh, happy. How, how convenient. And, and he, well, he, well he, he, he was a good culler. Yeah, and, and he was. We, and we also need the pigs gone. Yeah. He's just after about, oh, it must be getting close to 20 years, maybe maybe 18 years of culling. He's just walked away from that contract. And he told me the other day, when I started, a couple of rangers would pull up with me on the side of the road. We'd point out some landmarks, yep. and I'd be told, get in there and get it cleaned out between that point and that point. Now, of course, the landmarks weren't just the pointy bits you could see. All parties understood the terrain, yep. how those animals act inside that terrain, what time of the se- you know, what season it was. There was a whole bunch of base understanding of nature and animals and yep. now he doesn't go anywhere near the site visit he ends up getting called into town and he yep. finds himself in an office with 15 people who wouldn't know which end of the pig was the head until they tried to feed a biscuit and that's the reality of the situation we the people who are not all there's a lot of good people there and, and i want to work with them so if anyone's listening i want to work <laughs> with you but there are people in there who, and including us politicians, because there's mm. areas I have no understanding of, we're making decisions on things we don't understand. And so it's, um, and we're also really trying to jam so much into our time that we don't have time to do the due diligence Uh, we should. Um, It it just makes me think, digressing a little bit, but a meeting a little while ago, a 600-page agenda and 41 attachments. Do you think I read all that? Do you think anybody in the place read all that? No, not even the person who stapled them all together. Absolutely. Well, a lot of it. Well, that's the other problem. 
that's the other problem to uh, mirror some of my co colleagues. Um, we've gone paperless, and I'm coping with that, although there are times when you need to print it out to be able to, especially when you're really drilling down on it. Yeah. But it comes to us in a special portal to make sure that we're not naughty people and spread it all around the place. Yeah. And that portal's almost impossible to work with. It really is. I sometimes have it open. And you can you can open it in multiple times. So I sometimes have it open 10 times across my screen trying to follow stuff. Um, big is not beautiful. And uh, I think the super city is uh, has been a problem. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? You know, the super city was supposed to deliver cost savings. Uh, it was supposed to reduce the head count of council staff with the super city. We've now got a third more staff than we had back when there was three city councils in Auckland. We haven't had, got any better services for that. You know, maybe the water situation is probably better now that it's done citywide. I don't know enough about that. But it seems that there are no savings. Our rates bills are increasing every year. Uh, we don't get anything extra for that. In fact, what we get is a whole lot more inconvenience because now we've got these pedestrian crossings that are large jutter bars. We've got 30 kilometre an hour zones when there's no record anywhere to be seen of any sort of injuries on these roads. Uh, most of them are fender benders. And we've got you know health and safety, road cones, everything for Africa just to make our life difficult but they're not even maintaining the roads, so that makes it even more difficult. And now become everyone complains about SUVs, but it's actually the, the necessary vehicle you, you need to have to get it. Uh, I almost feel like I'm back in Suva, you know, um, <laughs> where I was born, where, where there's more potholes than there is road surface. And everyone drives around in SUVs because that's what you need. We're almost become a third world city, but we're all going rah, rah, rah. We're a first world city, but we're not, are we? Um, no, well, no, you, um, you summarize my thinking most of the time. I think we are recoverable, like we are close to what we used to be. We are watching a slide. We're not at the bottom and we just have to catch ourselves and, um, and, uh, come to our senses and get back to core services and reality. I, I, again, I think it's the data wave. I, I, I think it's all, there's so much data, that all this IT stuff, it's an employer in itself. And um, when you look at the, the, the problems council has and, and, and our CCOs with data, data management, you know, look at Auckland Transport. My heart goes out to them. They got, um, they got some malicious wear uh, and some people ransomware attacked them, so they yep. say. Yeah, but um, think of the dollars that was spent recovering that that could have gone to their core purpose. And I don't believe that, you know, they say, and I've heard this said several times. Oh well, you have to measure it to be able to manage it. Yeah, right. But again, um, our measuring capabilities are the only things that are first world, and there's no connection between that and the fix. Yeah, see, I I know that. I know this personally because it affected us, and it's the reason why we ceased doing the job, is that you know you, they talk about what gets measured gets done, and then they dream up these measures. And it might be a surprise to you to know that a, a large number of contracts, because most of the work the council does, they don't do themselves anymore. Any they contract, no. Yeah, they contract everything. And in those contracts, there's little clauses that say something like, if your business that's doing this job has any machinery or uh, trucks or utes or vehicles, they have to be sign written in a certain way yep. so that it looks like it's the council doing the work, even though it's a contractor. And on top of that, there's a minimum standard for the vehicles and equipment and everything like that so that it doesn't look shabby. And so you might have a very cost-effective crew that is going around fixing potholes in parks. And they've got a 20-year-old truck and a 30-year-old grader or something like that. Uh, it's very cost-effective. Uh, they're very good workers and they do their job. But along comes the clipboard-carrying council officer and says, well, this truck's 20 years old. Um, I would draw your attention to this clause here. 
uh, your, your vehicles need to be no more than five years old. And so the business is now faced with having to expend capital on vehicles that are going to end up looking like the one that's 20 years old in five years and have to replace it again and again and again. And that cost needs to be passed on to the end user, which is the rate payer ultimately, but the council. But then the council says, oh, no, we've got a sinking lid on these things, so we can only fix this number of potholes or do this many meters of cracks. And you've now got these huge capital expenses, and you can only bill it X number of dollars. It doesn't make financial sense. So only the very large contractors can now do it because they've got the capital wherewithal to do these things, whereas before there used to be little contractors around doing all of these jobs and doing them very well and to the standard. And now you've got these massive contractors that are doing it. They're lackadaisical about everything, but their trucks and their cars and everything looks really spick and span. So they pass that test, but they're not actually fixing anything because it's not worth their while to do it. Absolutely. And you touch on so much stuff there. And the smaller contractors working in their communities had the biggest driver to do a good job, and that was peer pressure. They were doing it for their neighbours. They were doing it for the people in their local community, and everyone knew who they were. And they did a good job on them in, in the majority. Um, the I've been told in the past that they were, you know, ripping the system. I don't believe that at all. Even That's if they were, true. it was nowhere near as expensive it is now with all this nonsense we go through. And then, of course, the council has five super contract areas, and uh, and I've seen the contracts uh, for those and the social. Our council contracts have even got social outcomes in the procurement. Um, you will have so many uh, 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 AG, AG, QP, whatever they are. Um, you will have um, so many immigrants. You, you will have so many Pacifica. You will have. Um, and I, I know I, I, I challenged this at a board meeting many years ago. I said, "Oh, come on!" I said, "All I'm interested in is the outcomes. I don't measure on anything else." And and um, uh, you know, they. I was challenged. Oh well, you know, you wouldn't say that in public. I did, and it went off. Everybody said, mm. "Yes, exactly." All we want is good, competent people for the job. When I got elected as a local board member in 2018, I went in there and all of a sudden certain specific things that I'd never thought of became mm. centre point because, oh, wow, look at that, and we have to do something. And so that was that was interesting. I've never lost sight of the, the drainage and the potholes, but, man, there's always a mountain over the top of that pothole And now that I've become a councillor, the same thing's happened. I I walked in there and all of a sudden, oh, okay. So, And one of those mountains is the philosophy and the way that we um, have all these. It's almost the fault of being just high vision. The number of times I'm told, oh, councillor, that's management, your governance. Um, You've Mm. got to know what the management's up to, to be able to do good governance decisions, in my opinion. But I voted against the Auditor General uh, a few weeks ago. Now, I, the, they were having kittens beside me, and in the end, I abstained rather than vote against them. But the Auditor General, General has to audit our yearly accounts. So they came in and they said, blah, 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 blah. And then they said that our carbon, they mentioned our carbon targets and having mm. been okay. And I said, oh, well, excuse me, is the statement that the animals on council's farm parks is 20% of the um, corporate council's carbon emissions. Is that true? Oh, well, we work with the figures we're given. Yeah, but you're an auditor, not an accountant. Is that figure correct? And so I finally said, look, I, I'll give you the answer myself. It's not correct. It can't be correct because mm-hmm. the figures you audited for the council corporate is actually not the roadworks, not the maintenance, not mm-hmm. the open space services. All it is is the corporate. And and because parks is the only thing that's really still inside that corporate um, control and structure and, and operation, you've measured the, the animals as 20% of our emissions. And and then they, uh, and, and so I challenged the figure and they said, well, these carbon targets are breaking down into A, B, and C. And the ones you're talking about, Falcon, Hogan, Ventia, and all the contractors, not to just try to name those guys, mm. all the guys out there doing the real work, their carbon emissions aren't going to be measured until I think they said 25, 26 or something. And I said, so not only is this today totally wrong because the cows are only 2% of the problem and you've taken all the, we, the council, have taken all the other contributing amounts away. When you do count C, 
all of a sudden the headlines in the paper are going to be council misses its carbon targets by 4,000%. Well, they just shoot all the animals. That'd solve the problem, wouldn't it? Meet all their carbon targets immediately. <laughs> yeah, you're just trying to crank me up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a ridiculous thing. Like, I know somebody who supplies a product to the council, and they were called into a meeting several months ago. It was last minute. Like, we need you to come in. And I said, well, sorry, we, you know, we've got other work. You're normally our only cu- customer. We need you to come. They said, no, no, we need you to come in. They said, what's it about? Well, we need to talk to you um, because you haven't answered our questions about uh, what you're doing in your business to supply us with product for our council businesses and what you're going to do to reduce your carbon footprint so that our carbon footprint can be reduced. And they said, well, we grow these things and we supply them to your council businesses you know, for the things that they consume, we can't change how something grows, right? It's a product that grows. It grows, it has a limited lifetime, it gets harvested, it gets sent to the council uh, businesses. And I'm just being really careful about what I'm saying here because it can be identified. Yep. And there's nothing we can do about changing the genetics of a living organism in order to meet your carbon footprint requirements for these business units that you're managing. and the outputs of the things that we're providing to you for that. So I don't know how we can possibly meet it. And in hindsight, if we lose the if we lose the contract because we won't answer your stupid questions about climate change, well then so be it because your five percent of our company will go and get a customer somewhere else. But the reality is, is you can't get these products anywhere else. So we're not answering your questions. And they dug in on that, and it turned into a disciplinary issue with the council that these, their contractor wasn't meeting the requirements, which were arbitrarily uh, applied in the contract. Uh, and they've been supplying the council for forty years. Look, look, it, and and we have to stand up for common sense. And I I beg everybody to mm. to say it straight how they find it, and let us, the council, struggle councillors struggle with the results of that. So the Ports of Auckland, they've told council, and it's not, it's not, it was in the paper, I'm just thinking because I'm being careful too, they're not going to meet the carbon targets we've given them. They can't. And the straddle carriers are 70% of their emissions. And, you know, someone mentioned, oh, we could electrify them. <laughs> well, well, the fact is that the Ports of Auckland, as a very good CEO, just recovered them from a, uh, a terrible financial situation, which was basically all, or most of it, tied to trying to automate or autonomise the, the straddle carriers. Mm. So there's been hundreds of millions thrown down the drain because of, of, of all that. And then the real fact that we should be strug- uh, focusing on is if we move the Ports of Auckland anywhere, and it will, it will be kilometres away, anywhere with 200 and, bill- and billions of dollars. Yeah, then the carbon, and we were told at one stage that it was, there was a figure, I'm trying to remember, 20 or 200 million kilograms of extra carbon emitted if we move the port from where it is, because sure, okay, it's not an export port, an import port, but the consumption is in Auckland. So therefore, 80% of that port, I'm, I know it's high, I'm guessing that figure, it, it was, the majority of that port's, activities go straight into Auckland. That's the most carbon efficient way you can get it straight into Auckland. So um, I, I, I looked around the room as that was being told to us and, um, and you know, there's people horrified and other people going, Ooh, and, uh, and other people, you know, we all took it our own way, but there's nothing we're going to do about that. There's nothing, the, the best thing we can do about that is just make sure that the operation is efficient and as as modern as possible, and uh, gets its core services done, concentrates on core services, and applies the best of technology as it comes along. And we don't need to be leading edge either, because there's mm. a there's a risk and a cost comes with that that we don't need to do. Again, to digress, one of the things that really annoys me in council, and I've started challenging it everywhere. We want to be exemplatory or exemplar. No, we don't. We just need to do our job, do it well. We don't need to be the world leaders. leader. Yeah. No, let someone else do the leading, and we can look over their shoulder and go, "Well, that's good. Oh, that's proved itself. We'll adopt that." But yeah. we, but we got a whole bunch of people 
who want to get into their job and they want to be part of, you know, they want to be exemplar. It's not their money they're being exemplar on. I've been in business as a mechanic for 40 years. I've been a registration centre. I've been an a alternate fuel um, in, uh, installer. installer. And I can tell you, man, that those things were fun, enjoyable, and uh, pride, pr- uh, 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 of proud of, of, of the sort of conversions I did. Didn't make a bloody dollar. And by the time it all stopped, I made enough just to pay for all the special equipment I brought to do it. It's just ridiculous. There's, this, there's these layers and layers and layers. I mean, you know, when the super city was formed, we were told there was going to be savings. We were also told at the time that the government had decided that they were going to have a new thing that for Auckland. It was only going to be for Auckland, and it was never going to be anywhere else. And that was the creation of this independent Maori statutory board, where assets of the council would now be jointly managed together with this independent Maori statutory board. And because that we did that, that was going to honour the treaty and give Maori a voice. And that meant we didn't need to have Maori wards or uh, separate Maori councillors. We had these unelected, appointed, iwi elite people who got their jobs because of who they know or who their family is, and but that was going to solve all our problems. And then I saw last week there was a proposal for, and again, this is one of those things that you that you say is driven by government. Uh, council had to assess or uh, work out whether or not it needs to have a new level of bureaucracy and a new level of councillors that were elected on the basis of race and have Maori seats. Now, you were one of the 11 councillors that voted against that and said, you're actually voting against having it for the next election, but it hasn't made the argument or the discussion go away. It's just kicked the can down the road for another term, basically. And then unholy hell broke loose that you were apparently now a racist along with the other 11, and we had To Henere tweeting that who, who isn't on the independent Maori statutory board in his unelected positions on these council committees, being consulted about everything to do with Maori, and he announces on Twitter that he's unhappy with us, that what his message was, was to quote, a message to those 11 councillors who voted no on Maori wards in fact, to the council at large, I will now vote no and oppose everything you put forward at any one of my committees, which are planning and CCOs. And I will also raise that strategy with our board, meaning the independent Maori statutory board, at the next meeting. That just seems like brown mail, utu, retribution, and threats. Well, do you see it that way? No. I just take no notice of the bullshit. Um, it's just, it's just politics, and we're all just humans, mm. and um, they can apply whatever pressure they like. You know, I'm fourth generation, proudly fourth generation from the Waitakere's. I've got some land left over. I've got land there of my own. I've gifted twenty five acres of riparian right property to regional parks many years ago. Yep. Um, uh, my family, my extended family, own a, a little hill there in 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 the Waitakere's, which is um left is being incorporated in nineteen thirty nine as Hui Private Reserve. And uh, on that is the most uh, preserved pass site at the top of that hill in the Waitakere's. Yeah. Um, my uh, granddaughter is uh, part Maori uh, ethnicity from north, and they live in Wangarei. I've got a couple of granddaughters. Let's say, and my and, and my immediate family are the biggest shareholders in that private reserve. Mm. So my granddaughter, uh, because of a few other funny things inside humanity, how it all works with our own family, our own far now, mm. my granddaughter probably will end up the largest shareholder in that uh, European title, Hill of significance to Maori in Auckland. Yep. She will be Mana Fenua in Wangarei. She yep. will be Ma Tawaka in Auckland. This is the future. We're all mm. going to be the same thing by the time. This is this is the future. When it comes down to the uh, Maori boards, etc., and uh, the treaty, I, I'm no treaty specialist. 
I have no, pro- I don't understand co-governance. I have no problem with partnership. I've had a bloody good partnership with my wife since we were 16. And also, the trades are going brown. The Maori and Pacifica grossly outnumber the European in, in the trades, and they're all my mates. My good friend Jim was my foreman for 27 years, um, ran my business for the last 10 years as his own, um, a Maori guy, a, a decent bloke. His daughter and her husband are now taking it over and are, are, are running it and stuff. It's just life. And it, if we're going to have um, – uh, I, I, I support the Maori Ward seats because they're democratic. But mm-hmm. that's all we need. We've already got a special relationship, supposedly, l- legislatively, and I don't need to get into that, but the council treats uh, mana whenua as a decision-making partner. Yep. They treat Matawaka as a key stakeholder, like most of the rest of the entities. As well. And then we've got the Independent Maori Statutory Board there, who, uh, uh, from what I can see, have been set up as a uh, uh, Maori watchdog role. But they are populated by mana whenua. Um, there's a court case taking place at the moment inside Maori Dim, challenging how that's, how that's set up. Let's just let's just set this thing up simply and properly in a democratic manner, and um, I have not opposed to them having a couple of specific seats uh, like the government. I, I don't know any better, any less. That's just my gut feel to it all. Um, common sense and practicality doesn't worry me, doesn't scare me. What scares me is academic ideology that is so disconnected from our daily lives it has no point to me. But is, wasn't the proposal for the Maori wards to be on top of or in addition to the independent Maori statutory board? It wasn't the proposal. It was the fact. The fact is that the independent Maori statutory board comes with a um, under different legislation yeah. that council has no control over. Yeah. So really what was happening, the way I perceive it, there was presented to all parties a small opening to deliver some Maori ward seats to Auckland Council. And like everything else, not just Maori stuff, all of council stuff, we've got opportunistic actions all over the place. Someone wants to lock up a specific walking track in the Waitakere's and, um, you know, all of a sudden Carrie Dieback comes along, oh, man, that track's got no carry on it whatsoever, but we we'll lock that anyway as a precautionary measure. And then all of a sudden it's going to get opened again. Oh, we don't want that. You know, we don't want that. Wait, I don't know why they don't want it. Maybe they don't want it because it's the end of a dead end road. Maybe they don't want it because it's, you know, because they think they've got some fancy coloured frog down it or something or other. But they go utilising any action they can for the long-term purpose rather than working on the purpose. That's that's how I see it. And mm. so we end up with third world results because we don't use first world common sense. You know, I, I, <laughs> I don't know how better to explain myself because I tell you, I struggle with understanding what I see happening in front of me on a daily basis. Yeah. I have no problem with um, my Maori friends having a seat beside me or more on council because they, the ones out there on the street, have some bloody common sense, man. <laughs> and uh, and that's what we, if I can inject common sense into council, I'll use any syringe I can get my hands on. So that's the thing, isn't it? Because if you do have common sense and you uh, resonate with the public, and when I say the public, I'm not talking about segregating it by or dividing it on the basis of race or whether or not you you're from you know. I mean, I was born in Fiji. You know, do I do I say I'm Fijian all the time? Well, no, I don't. But I was born in Fiji, but I don't use that as a crutch. And so I, I look at at these things and I think, why have we all of a sudden diverged from being ratepayers or the public into separating people by race or class or whatever you know we a classic example right is when the when all of the councils were amalgamated there was a homogenization process for rates that went on so that 
everyone could theoretically have a core uh, set of rates that were based not on where you live, but because these are the core services that are provided. Um, because, you know, you've got suburbs like Oraki, Remuera, Epsom that are paying huge amounts of rates because it's based on property values. It is a regressive tax system or progressive tax system. But but the reality is, is that they take all the money from those areas, but they also spend it in those areas. And so the poorer areas get less money spent on. The further out you are from the centre of governance in Auckland Council, the less services you get. So as a, here I was living in Whangaparaa, paying you know, homogenised rates, but there was no council rubbish service in Whangaparaa. If you want your rubbish picked up, you have to pay for it. Parts of the North Shore, you have to pay for your rubbish to be picked up, but in Auckland Central and uh, Manukau, the rubbish is picked up by the council. And so there is, there, there's still these structural and systemic issues to do with rating and services that exist. And we've got large amounts of rural people in the boundaries of Auckland and their roads are appalling, particularly in Rodney. And, you know, I'll be talking to Greg Sayers about that later on. There is a perception that Auckland Council still concentrates on the CBD and not so much the further out you get. Oh, well, it, that's not a perception. That's my observation. I sit in... <laughs> The amount of debate we have, which is um, CBD centric, is is huge, and I've actually been penning a bit of a post about that uh, as we speak. Um, mm. But look, let's let's just go back because I like looking at the common sense. Yeah. Um, the um, food scraps rubbish collection. Yeah. I've been after that since I was on the local board, since I first got my first presentation. So. We're going to save carbon and all this sort of nonsense. No, it's not nonsense. I, I I have no problem in saving anything because it saves money and makes us more efficient. And I do think that we are putting, we, we, we don't want all our eggs in one basket. But one entity could have aerobically composted our food scraps on Pukatutu. Yeah. And I've seen a report where they would have saved a minimal amount of carbon emissions doing it. Yeah. But oh no, council decides we're going to truck it to Reparoa, put it into a digester, to turn it into methane, to then supply or to sell that methane to a hothouse uh, complex, the biggest one in Australasia beside it. That's why they went down there. Then they're going to take the leachate out of the bottom of the digester, put that in plastic bottles and truck it back to Auckland and sell it through our our social enterprise shops as super duper fertilizer. So I, I said the other day, I've been working on this for ages, Reparoa. I, so I said, okay, what's your carbon emissions taking all these food scraps to Reparoa? This is a couple of years ago I said that. And, oh, it's zero. How's it zero? Oh, it's a backhaul. Oh, so, you, in other words, there's aggregate on the trucks, there's roading material on the trucks coming the other way. Yes. I said, well, we shouldn't be getting our roading material from Taupo either. We should be getting that closer. There's plenty closer. So then recently, just right now, I've got questions in about it. So the way I understand at the moment is... That's insane. This is the first time I've heard that, it, that we're trucking... Oh, it's worse than that. We're it's tracking than that. We're, taking food. It a, we're taking it to a point in South Auckland and squeezing the water out of it because they've realised, oh, it's 80% water, so we're trucking a whole heap of water. To tell so them. we've got this a water squeezing plant. Well, it's a compressing auger, which is a common yeah. thing for effluents to extract the water. This is pig it. food. I mean, what, yeah. we're talking about pig so, food here, so right? Then they, <laughs> so then they take it to Reparoa. Now, I've asked the question because I'm pretty sure they'd have to add water to make it digest properly. Anyway, the issue I asked was, and it was mainly a financial issue that I was trying to pin down on. I'm trying to find out where the spending's going, etc. So I said, I understood that the council had put, and I won't say the figure because they tell me I was wrong, a large amount of money into this startup. And I was told, yes, we have, but nowhere near the amount you've mentioned. But we don't own any of the startup. We just put it in as a contribution at the beginning, and that gives us cheaper charges. So I said, okay. It's not cheaper. We paid for it. <laughs> Let me finish. It gets better. <laughs> so I said, okay. In the discussion, I became aware that we pay a gate charge per tonne for the food scraps we send there. So I said, okay, how much do we get for our methane? Oh, uh, that varies. Well, okay, what's the average? Well, we don't really know because actually the methane income offsets our gate charge. Oh, okay. So trying to find a hard figure I could lock down on, I said, what does it cost us to cut the stuff down there? 
oh, that's calculated negate charge too. So all of a sudden I start sniffing. The private sector is probably rolling around like possums on dope, laughing so much at these contracts. There is no visibility. So we are collecting it all. I can see about a thousand ways that that startup is tucking Auckland Council. (laughs) And now to the defense of some of the people in there, and this is the problem. They can't. You can, because you've been out there at the coalface. You know, I can because I've been tucked a bunch of times myself and I've lost money by being just plain stupid. Yeah. And so here I am as a counsellor trying to get an understanding of the fiscal position of this project so that I can make good governance decisions. And it is totally invisible. It's totally cloaked in fog and smog and smoke. And my question is, is that by pure mistake or by construct? My suspicion is that it never made a business case in the beginning. And so therefore, all the facts were hidden. So the business case couldn't be judged. Well, you know what you should do? You should take that, go and sit down beside Morris Williamson and point him in that direction because he's got all the data from the financial system. Been there, done that. We're working on it. Yeah, good. Because if he can find where it's buried in the spreadsheets, he will be the one that will find where it's buried in the spreadsheets. I've got the questions in right now, and so far the email back has been, oh, dear councillor, we're going to take some time getting it together. That's the answer for everything, isn't it? It is. Well, Ken, it's been fascinating talking to you about all of this, and I suspect that we could go on and on and on for hours and hours about the systemic problems that are in the council but we don't have that much time and neither do you. So I'm thanking you now for the time you have given us to give us a little insight into the issues at Auckland Council. And I appreciate you coming on the, on the crunch with me today. And I appreciate having a chat. It relieves my internal pressure valve. So thank you very much. You're most welcome. And we'll have to have a chat again sometime. Okay. See you later. Thank Bye. you. You start off talking about a few things and one thing leads to another. And here we are an hour later with a record of even more problems almost all of which are caused or exacerbated by the civil servants. We like to blame the councillors, but it's clear where the real blame lies. Tell me your thoughts on what Ken had to say by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Our text machine is now live. Send us your thoughts by texting your message to 2057. That's 2057. So get in touch with us now. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy, right here on RCR. Greg Sayers is an Auckland councillor and an experienced businessman. He's an independent candidate who was re-elected as the Rodney Councillor on the Auckland Council. He convincingly unseated the sitting incumbent the year he stood for election by an unprecedented margin of the votes. He's here to discuss some of his frustrations at the Council a year on from his re-election. He joins me now. Greg Sayers, welcome to The Crunch. Yeah, thanks, Cam. Great to be here and appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, I thought I'd make this program a little bit about, you know, the past year or so, you've been re-elected as the councillor in Rodney. There's some challenges that Auckland Council is having, and some of those issues were, of course, brought to the fore with the cyclone and the rainfall and everything at the beginning of the year, particularly around rural communities and rural roads. I earlier talked to Ken Turner, who explained some of the issues that he's been facing. I thought I'd give you a call and uh, and have a chat with you about how you think the last year has gone and some of the issues that Auckland Council faces in particular in your area. Oh, thanks, thanks for that, Cam. I'm glad you had a chat to Ken Turner. He's he's doing a great job as a councillor for his his ward as well. Yeah, I guess really what you're touching on there is around the increased costs and unexpected uh, bills that are now coming into the council to recover from those storms, but. Uh, kind of in the big picture, Cam, the council just still isn't light. This might be out there trying to do all this work and fix everything, but the public just doesn't have that level of trust in the Auckland Council. 
Yeah, I mean, it's something that raises its head. You know, on, on my show a couple of weeks ago, I asked what people thought about Wayne Brown. They seem to like him. They're just frustrated with the inability to seem to be able to pass some sensible things. You know, the borrowings of the council are sky high, uh, yet there seems to be a reluctance on the part of many councillors to address the rampant spending and out of control projects that are running that are just sucking up resources when we can't even get the basics like you know water reticulation rubbish collection particularly in Rodney rubbish collection is a real issue mm. and you know in um, fixing potholes and and slumped roads and all the damage that's come from years of poor maintenance or lack of maintenance yeah that's all true it's certainly a different beast than the private sector uh, you know with my experience in the private sector, if you asked your CE to find 10% savings so you could drive them into you know, other programs, it would happen It would happen overnight, Camels, they've lost their job. And I think what the Mayor's discovering is the complexity of, of Auckland Council and its rules and its regulations and probably uh, the difficulty of you know, having to bring along with your 20 other councillors so you've got 11 and vote majority when you actually want to get things done that you want to get done. So, uh, uh, you know, I think he's finding it hard you know, we have councillors that are uh, defend heavily the labour force and people not to lose their jobs. Where you know, actually, what's required probably is some deep axe wielding and uh, some cuts into the organisation. And those, when I say cuts, Cam, I don't mean they definitely have to be straight costs. They can be productivity. So why is that middle management so bloated inside of there, and why can't more decision making be pressed down into the organisation? And when, you know, if you press decision making down to organization, you don't need so many supervisors that you have to go back up to, right? And mm. I'd also, and also the other, other interesting dynamic, I guess, with the council is you have Auckland Transport as a delivery arm, and then they have contractors underneath them as delivery services providers, you know, the downers yep. and voters yep. of the world. Now, they're probably doing a good job, but uh, they're only doing what they get told to do by those staff. So, there needs to be a significant, in my mind, cultural, organisation performance transformation of Auckland Council uh, to lift its productivity and find those savings that are in there. Fortunately, I'd say under the Wayne Brown administration, at least we've got somebody who's prepared to shake the tree and try and make that happen to the best of his ability. And he is working very hard at it compared to the other mayors that we have had. Yeah. Well, let's just touch on Auckland Transport for a little bit. You know... <laughs> I drive around Auckland and there seems to be this proliferation of these raised pedestrian crossings, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, that create massive jutter bars. You can't see them properly at night. Um, who asked for them, right? <laughs> exactly. Who asked for these? Who said that we needed this? I mean, what are the statistics to show that a raised pedestrian crossing is safer or What's the rationale? Because I would imagine that each one of those raised pedestrian crossings costs in the vicinity of something like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. They do, Cam. Yeah, yeah. It, it, like honestly, like who asked for them? Who who you, asked? Look, you look, look, it's not, I'm not surprised you asked that type of question because it's not just you that would be making those comments. There's Aucklanders at large that are making that comment all the time. In fact, you know they find it bewildering what's going on there. And, you know, it's really ideological whims of Auckland transport engineers. So the tail's wagging the dog there. And again, I'd have to say that Wayne's onto it, Wayne Brown, the, the mayor, he, he wants legislative change so the councillors can get in control of that beast, Auckland transport, and you know, have the orders going the other way around rather than mm. the company getting. See, this is the thing. There's, there's all these initiatives. I mean, you know, again, I live in Takapuna. Suddenly, all of a sudden, it's 30 kilometres an hour with yeah. big red paintings on the road at exorbitant cost, yeah. let alone the use of the trucks and the road cones and everything else to do it. Yeah, narrowing the road for a cycle. Narrowing way. the road, yeah. um, you know, yeah. turning areas into pedestrianised areas. I mean, shopping yeah. is bad enough with getting near these places, and now they're just like choking it off and wondering why all these businesses are going out of business. Again, who asked for 30 kilometres an hour well, around these, in, these little towns, or 60 kilometres an hour in rural roads. Uh, it's an interesting story here that I'm happy to share. I, uh, I rang one of the major developers that were doing a development in, in my ward, the Rodney Ward North, and asked them, why on earth are you making those roads so narrow? You know, you've got one person parked on one side, one on the other, and you can't get a fire engine through there, let alone a 
if you want to run a bus service. They said, look, Greg, we agree with you. We're, our initial plans were to have decent roads in there, but we were told by Auckland Transport to narrow them for traffic calming measures. So they're even getting directed by that organisation, Cam. It's really just it takes away from the whole place shaping of those new... Uh, new surely, uh, the di- yeah, surely the directive of Auckland Transport should be to make transport around the city easier, not more difficult. Well, you can see what's happening there, mate. Yeah. The, the ideology, as I mentioned before, has probably taken over from reality. Isn't that the problem, though, that we've that got, the got these sort of highfalutin ideas being promulgated by the civil servants and no one's actually de- dealing with reality and how we actually yeah. need to get around our city? Yeah, it's a real tough one to get over. Just the whole setup of the super city cam was that the whole idea was to have those CCOs at arm length from the politicians. In other words, as your listeners probably know, there's this chief executive between us and the operations of Auckland Transport, then the board of directors and between that as well. So that needs to change. And what we would like to see, or the majority of us councillors would like to see, is that more control come directly under those elected members because we represent the voice of our ratepayers. We know what they're saying about it. And we just would like to see that all turned around and the, the directions coming from the rate payers and the people that pay the bills rather than some sort of ideology. Yeah. So tell me about Rodney and what are the issues that you're getting on a day-to-day basis as the councillor in Rodney? Well, I was impressed how in touch you seem to be with them, actually, Cam. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So look, well, I lived yeah. in Rodney for a while, so oh, I, I kind of right. know that. Yeah, good one. Yeah, look, it's, uh, uh, Rodney makes up half of the land mass of the super city. It's a huge ward. It has one councillor, uh, one local board. Um, it's undergoing growth. For people who drive north now have seen that we'll be driving on a motorway that's opened up all that area up there. So Walkworth's just expanding rapidly. There's growth nodes like uh, Millwater, Milldale uh, happening. Uh, there's significant growth uh, just in the rural areas with the ability to people to subdivide their land as the right through the unitary plan. So there's an awful lot of people wanting to go and live live in that area, and with that comes traffic. And historically, those roads, if you've driven them, if you get off the main state highways and arterials, they're unsealed, Cam. So uh, years of underinvestment, you've got property owners there that are living on unsealed and by that, I mean gravel roads. Yeah. And uh, they pothole and in the winter and the, the dust nuisance in the summer. The, the good news is there that fortunately under this term, and I have to take uh, my hat off to, to Wayne, that he listened to those. He came up for the day. Yeah. Listened to every ratepayer group that I could get in front of him. After seven hours, he'd, he asked if he'd met everybody in Rodney because they all, all, all talk, spoke to him very politely, but got across the message that, uh, you know, those basic infrastructures that our urban cousins take for granted, like having your road sealed and having traffic lights on a footpath, they don't exist in, in the Rodney Ward and it's overdue and they should have been there. Yeah. So so finally they're starting to get some funding thanks to, to the help of the Mayor. We've gone from, so on those unsealed roads, the maintenance budgets have just this year when every other ca- budget in Auckland Council was being reviewed and cut, the maintenance budgets got doubled which meant that instead of having two grading crews, because you have to grade those roads. Yeah, I mean, it's quite difficult, isn't it, with rural roads, because getting rid of water off the surface of the road is most important. Now, with the tar seal road, obviously, you've got an impervious layer there that, you know, there's still a crown in the road, but it's not as important, the crown, in terms of the size, uh, as it is for gravel roads or dirt roads, as well as making sure your culverts are clean and all of those to make sure water is being taken away because it's water that destroys the roads rather than anything else, isn't it? Yeah, that's the secret. The secret is keeping those water tables under control. So with now, what I was just going to say there, Cam, is they had two grading crews out there trying to do the whole network. <sighs> as I said, it's half the size of the, of the you know, whole of Auckland. Yeah. So now they've got five with one. So they've got their own areas that they look after. There's another crew that will go out. So if you get a customer complaint, they can whip out there and do it. So that was effective first of July. So I'm very pleased that those ratepayers in Rodney and residents will start to see, you know, dramatic improvement in, in the maintenance of those roads. And the, the key to that is the creative drivers in terms of their ability to be able to, as you say, shape Absolutely, the road yeah. in the right way. On top of that, 
ideally you'd have those roads sealed. There's some roads out there that are overdue for sealing for years and just hasn't happened under the super city, as I mentioned, you know, anywhere else it, it would have. It yeah, it's like, it's like been. the roads around Wainui and that, aren't they? I mean, it's there's a lot of traffic around those and there's a whole lot of dirt roads there that really should yeah. be sealed. And some of the ones that, you know, that are coming off, um, you know, the state highway out Cow Copper Copper Way and around yeah. there, again, there's a lot of infill housing going in. That's dirt right. roads are really unsustainable. No, yeah. The, the other thing is with the storm, even though the storm brought, you know, as you know, Mirai and what was in, in my area, and they got hit really hard by the other areas, mm. right at Puhoi and, and Dairy Flat. That storm has highlighted to Auckland Council the need to, because it's all interrelated to what you just talked about. If those rivers aren't flowing, Cam, the water's yeah. got nowhere to go uh, off the road. So everything floods and it's just a disaster. So if we can get those rivers and streams cleared out, which is happening. That helps everybody, not only in terms of those roads staying dry, but also people stopping people's uh, properties from flooding. Yeah, oh, exactly. What sort of frustrations are you experiencing being a councillor and trying to get attention to some of these issues that your ratepayers are screaming for? Well, you know, it really is the big league and we're playing hardball. You know, we're, we're New Zealand's biggest council. We've got a asset base of $55 billion and a revenue of 6.6. .6. So you've got to take that seriously. And if you can't live within your means, in other words, if you can't make that $6.7 billion revenue uh, stretch and you need to go into further debt, that's not you're not running a successful organisation. Uh, that's not sustainable. And since I, I'd go so far as to say since the start of the super city, in 10 years that our debt's gone, you know, it's sitting at $13 billion. Well, $12 billion of that was in the last 10 years. And it's it's, like, it's yeah. eye-wateringly expensive too for servicing. Well, it's over every day. It's like a lotto ticket. It's about $1.5 million a day just to pay the interest on all of that. Of course, when you've got a growing city, you've got to have the infrastructure in there, but you've got to be able to pay for it. So what is the core business of Auckland Council? Auckland Council has not defined that since the start of the super city. Mm. I'm frustrated that it, that debate hasn't occurred to say, well, what is core business? Basically, when when all those councils got amalgamated, just all the services got brought across and they continued to be funded. So uh, which ones should we still be funding and which uh, which ones shouldn't we be funding? And with that, you'll find uh, you know some cost savings as well. There seems to be this abiding belief within government, local and central government, that all spending is good spending and all debt is good debt until it's not, with no recognition that the way that the council services its debt is to basically rape the pockets of the ratepayers. And they won't take measures to address that. So, you know, you hear all these councillors who say, oh, no, it's terrible, we're selling assets and we'll be losing the income from those assets. But the reality is, is the income from those assets is marginal at best because of the debt servicing. And the income that you get from those assets is actually just paying debt. Mm. Now, some debt is good, right? Good If you are spending money on infrastructure that's going to last 50, 60, 70 years, that's the sort of thing you want to fund with debt not these nice-to-have Womble projects that seem to proliferate. I mean, I was talking to a councillor down south, you know, in, in the South Island, and they were saying that the, their council funds something like 35 national days, you know, like, I don't know, Pacifica national holidays and, you know, all Eid and all of these sorts of holidays. That everyone's coming to council with these demands for money and that's all being funded by these huge amounts of debt. And clearly in Auckland, it's the same, where you've got Diwali and all of these things funded by the council. But essentially, it's being paid not for by the ratepayers, but by debt. Mm. That's the sort of stuff you actually shouldn't be spending debt on or incurring debt to cover. I get quite surprised why some of my colleagues who, who uh, think that debt is just the way that you run a council and I don't disagree with the idea that you've got to have debt, and if you do take on debt, that should be paid off across generations that get to use in the future. That's fine, but you also just can't keep taking on debt. 
you know, you've got to be able to pay down your debt. Well, we haven't paid any down. We're paying interest only. So as I mentioned, the numbers are the uh, eye-watering. That just you can't continue about that. You know, the, the promise of the super city was less staff and more services, but we've actually still got just the opposite, haven't we? We've got more staff and less services. Well, that's the thing we were promised. You know, we've seen this time and time again. Politicians say we're going to do this. There's going to be these amazing savings. There'll be less staff. And what we get is actually more staff, no savings, increased rates, and things are no better off. Yeah. And, look, and we keep to... falling for it. <laughs> look, uh, I'm sure that, you know, Wayne, I hope you get to have a chance to talk to Wayne on your show, but, you know, he must be under pressure. He's facing barriers every which way he goes. It would probably be very helpful for the community put some pressure on their councillors to support the mayor and some of the things that he's trying to rectify, including what you've just spoken about, Cam. At least we've got a mayor that's set of a vision there. You know, he talks about his priorities there about fixing the infrastructure and stopping wasting and taking control about from the CCOs, et cetera, et cetera. He's even done a manifesto to the new government. But as I mentioned at the start of his show, if, uh, if he doesn't get the political support to be able to implement those, get on with it, then it's a bit of a lonely road, not only for him, but for other councillors and probably Aucklanders at large who voted him in to fix Auckland. Well, I mean, that's the thing. They did vote him in to fix Auckland. The voters in South Auckland stayed away. Uh, the successive Labour-led government, even though they were Labour and drag, they always hid their alliances, was rejected soundly at the last local body elections. And yet when it comes to actually making the hard decisions like paying down debt or having to sell assets, it seems, you know, Morris Williamson had the saying that everybody wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to die. Yeah. Yeah, he does. He does. He, he uses that. Morris is doing a good job in terms of holding the flame to the feet of the organisation as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, he's also floated the idea of fewer local boards, which, uh, you know, probably isn't a bad idea either, cutting the local boards down from... You know, we've got 22 local boards out there, down to about 13. That's you know, 50 less elected members and less support staff and less officers. That would probably be a good idea. As you know, it's all about you can do any of those things, and they might save you some money. But if the democracy doesn't improve, and by that I mean if those elected people aren't prepared to listen to their ratepayers and act for the best interests of the community, you're not making any ground. And this trust levels of Aucklanders of the council and the, the elected representatives will stay low. So, you know, that whole idea of Abraham Lincoln's of, you know, government of the people, for the people, by the people, you know, that's, that's fundamental that as a deliverable, uh, you know, by us as elected politicians back to our ratepayers. And I, I just hope that some of our elected members remember that. Yeah, I'm always reminded about the statement that Ronald Reagan made, you know, way back in the 80s. Famous statement, the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> you know, yeah. Because isn't that the way? When It seems that in society these days, whenever there's an itch to scratch or there's a particular ailment in the, in the community, someone says, oh, but why won't the council do something? And when they say do something, what they mean is pay money to someone to do something. Or get but, it for free is another one. Well, right. nothing's yeah. for free. There's no yeah. such thing as a free lunch. You know, you, you you've been in business. If you offer your staff free lunches, it's free to the staff, but it's not free to the business. Well, I'll tell you what I did notice when I was in business, and that's is when and I did this independently with a, a number of organizations as well, including the delivery arms of power companies, you know. They were service deliveries. If you decentralize your decision making, I'm not saying increasing the numbers, but I'm saying with the power and the ability for your staff and even your contractors, and I mentioned them a little bit earlier, to get on, do the job, and they've got the information uh, that the middle management have to make decisions. They can see the costs, they understand what's going on. These are bright, educated people that work in, in Auckland Council. Mm. You know, and they just don't get a chance to, they have to leave their brain at the gate, I think, in, in many circumstances. I get them come up to me at the water fountain and when I'm having lunch or in the lift and they'll share with me the frustrations that they're having. So I'm, I guess I'm saying that devolution of power down to employees, and I'll go even further, even to contractors, 
uh, who probably only do what they get told to do at the moment because you know engineers want to keep control over them, uh, would be a terrific way of changing the customer service and probably the trust levels that Aucklanders could have in, in the organisation. Uh, you know, that greater that idea of greater localism, we allow local contractors and local community volunteers and groups to deliver the local projects. They'll do it more cost effectively and keep an eye on it as well into the future. So that just hasn't materialised yet. And I think that's, uh, that's where we need to be heading. You touch on a key point there talking about contractors. Councils used to do a lot of the stuff themselves, yeah. but now they've contracted it out. And although technically the headcount of council should be smaller, in reality, it's actually bigger. I mean, we, we were promised that there would be savings in staff by the amalgamating the three cities into one. We've actually got more staff now by a considerable margin as a result. Arguably, we've got less services. We've got all these contractors that are out there. And, you know, I was just talking to Ken uh, earlier and uh, I explained to him how, you know, we used to have a contract cleaning the cesspits, you know, on the side of the road. There'd be one guy in a truck. Uh, we had flashing lights. and We'd pull up beside the cesspit, open the grate, suck out all the guts of it, put the grate back and drive on to the next one. The other day I saw happening, you know, in Manukau, the same place we used to do it. There was actually five people employed to do that. Uh, there was now vehicles in front and behind the truck. I mean, you can't miss the truck. They're enormous. Mm. And they had all these safety people wandering around uh, and putting out cones and all sorts of nonsense like that. And, and like in all the three or four years that we did the contract there, we never had a traffic incident by doing these cesspits. We never had any issues at all with anyone getting run over or anything like that. And it seems that the council... Uh, officers or within the council or someone is applying these health and safety regulations, which is leading to a proliferation of road cones, safety things, and as a consequence, massive expenditure and cost uh, exploding. So when it took one person to do it, now it takes five people plus all the gear. You can imagine the cost of that. Yeah, We're paying for that as ratepayers, and, and yeah. no one seems to have any of the wherewithal to say, well, hang on a minute. Well. Well, I totally agree with you. you know, your points are dead right, and the, I think that health and safety legislation gets taken to the beyond the nth degree in terms of uh, you know risk minimization. Even the license costs, can the user charges, compliance costs, consent costs—they've all skyrocketed. Yep. So not only are they costing more, but people are having to dip into their pockets far deeper just to you know, to pay for it. But you know, if I come back to the mayor, you know, the mayor's just one vote. Right, but he does set uh, the tone of the organisation. He sets the direction. He sets the vision. He's banging his fists on the table consistently. I can assure you to look at all those things. He's, it's just that it all happens at glacial speed. Would be his terms. Would be the words yeah. that he would use, uh, and that's extremely frustrating. You know, he's, you know, um, for example, uh, you know, we've read in the papers about his efforts with Auckland Transport and some of those things that you're talking about in that realm of the organisation, mm. that CTO. Uh, the the idea of getting the red cones removed, uh, what else was he working on there? The uh, or the transponders in the buses, the dynamic lane, laning, making progress, but it's so slow. It's a lack of urgency that uh, I think that's what he's uh, that's hit it, the, the, the barrier that he hits. Yeah, well, Just exactly. Got to keep pushing. Got to keep pushing. Well, you, you've got to keep pushing and you need to, I think, also wield a big bat. You need to wield the big bat, but you also need the support of 11 councillors at least around the table. And without that, why would those CCOs need to take you seriously? But it's more than the support of 11 councillors, isn't it? Because a lot of these uh, decisions are made by committees. And it's not just the councillors that sit on the committee, it's the unelected independent Maori statutory board members that sit on those committees as well, who you've got to get support from. And what we've just seen, you know, in the last week is we've got Toe Henare, who's gone back to his old union roots and decided he's going to work to rule and exact Utu on the 11 councillors who voted to not have Maori wards at the next local body elections. You know, I mean, the disconnect from Toe Henare in the first place, I mean, he's being paid to be an independent Maori statutory board member, and he's saying we want more 
wards and more councillors to sit over the top of what he's already doing that's supposed to be on behalf of and giving voice to uh, mana whenua in Auckland City. Mm. And he's essentially holding a gun to everybody's head saying, I'm going to vote no against anything that you put up. And, and you're on that list of the 11. So is Morris Williamson. So is Ken Turner. There's a few of you on that list. And he's saying, I'm going to vote no on anything that comes before the committee. And that may actually be the casting vote that makes sure that something that was promised to the ratepayers doesn't happen. That's right. So you're right. That's more than just the 11, isn't it? There's another couple you've got to get across the line in those situations. Just where we're on that, Cam, the voting of the Maori as you've just indicated, um, I did vote against those. In my mind, look, there's three things. Look, if you want to be a councillor, you can do the hard yards and get elected. Yeah. Nothing stopping anybody doing that, right? On top mm. of that, on top of that, it's actually a constitutional matter, and it should be going out to public referendum. I've said that from day one. You know, legislation got uh, brought in by Mahuta to try and well, it did it stop that because people didn't want it, so she wanted to override that. But it should be going back to a referendum. I hope the new government has formed looks at repealing that legislation so we can have a referendum on the on the subject. That's great. Whatever that referendum says, Cam, I'm happy to vote in, in the way that the people say. And finally, if you're going to have Maori seats, you can't have an independent Maori secretary board and Maori seats. It's got to be one or the other. Yeah. Exactly. But I mean, you're absolutely right. This is a constitutional issue. It's also a legislative issue. I mean, the independent Maori statutory boards were created by statute. That's why they're called yeah. statutory, right? Yeah. So what they're wanting is to keep and retain the law that pertains to their cushy jobs that are unelected and appointed because of who you are or what your family name or heritage or whakapapa is, and also have some race-based seats. But, yeah. you know, I noticed that the people who did vote against it have got such a diverse background. You know, Mike Lee, a hard-bitten socialist, but a practical man, he voted against it. You know, John Watson and Wayne Walker, you know, your neighbouring, you know, ward pals, I guess. Wayne especially is a bit of a womble. You know, he's a nice guy. I've had lots of chats with him. Um, but, you know, he would have been one that I would have thought would have supported that. No, he voted against it. And then you look at Ken out, out west. Uh, there's a large Maori community out west, and he's reflecting what his constituents are saying to him and voted against it. But you're right. This is a constitutional issue. It should be put to the people. But but it seems that people like Tau Henere and his, and his ilk don't like democracy. They just want to use intimidation, brown mail, and threats. And I don't think there's a place for that in Auckland Council. Uh no, there isn't, Kim, absolutely not. And everyone would agree with that. I'd say the majority of your listeners, certainly, anyway. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a very, you know, democracy is such important, and we touched on that a little bit earlier. We're here to represent the voice and the, the wishes and the wants of the people who put us in our jobs, right? Yeah. So I'm elected to do that. I expect if I don't do it, I shouldn't be re-elected. Uh, I, yeah. certainly, I certainly know that in terms of um, the direction that, that my ward gave me, my constituents on, on that particular subject. You know, I upheld their their wishes on that. But I, I guess the point I'd like to make is it's, it's probably it's easy to get sucked in by that machine, that ivory tower in there. And it's very important that you stay connected with your, with your constituents and, and listen to them. I think probably Winston Peters was a good example of if you do that, what what you can achieve, right? Yeah. yeah. So I know that there's a lot of good people in there trying to do good things by their uh, constituents, and I know that uh, the mayor is, feels that he has a mandate to go in there and, and fix the council. He doesn't want rates to go up. He doesn't want to go debt, debt, debt to go up. But I'll tell you now, when that 10-year, the next annual budget, or the, it's actually a 10-year budget, comes up for voting early next year, and Walkingers have their say on it, I'm extremely concerned that we'll end up with a vote that again increases the debt and puts the rates up above inflation. Hey, look, just while we're talking about referendums, mm. <laughs> just had the thought there, you know, well, it might not be a bad idea to have a referendum that for Aucklanders to say, you know, do we agree that rates should not increase above the rates of inflation? 
Yeah. I mean, this I is the thing is that, is that the Local Body Act actually allows for referenda quite easily. And all it takes is a little bit of political uh, wherewithal, uh, a bit of bravery to say, well, okay, seeing as you're all moaning about this, uh, this issue might be rates, might be Maori wards, might be selling the airport, actually put questions to a referenda in Auckland City and say things like, okay, you can either have a 15% rate increase or you can sell the airport, choose. Yeah. Or we can have a 9% rates increase or we can sack a third of our staff, choose, and put it in the hands of the voters. I think all hell would break loose if you did that, but it would force the issue and, and would force the debate. But it seems that on many issues, there's these tokenistic acceptance that this is exactly what we should be doing. You take the argument over the cycle bridge and the nonsense that went on for decades about clipping on an extra lane to an already busted bridge and the amount of money that Auckland Council funded these lobbyists so that they could keep pushing it. And then eventually the Labour government came in and came up with this billion-dollar boondockle that was never going to get built. But it was all pushed by council funding of lobby groups. Mm. It was insane. Yeah, absolutely. And when you say all hell would break loose if you, if you did this, I, by whom is the question? I, I'd be surprised if it was by the public camp. You might no, it would be the usual yeah. rowdies and renter mouths and renter mob type people <laughs> who would say, oh, no, we can't have a decision on Maori wards voted on by everybody because it'll be voted down. Well, well, that's called democracy. Make a better argument. Well, the I mean, Auckland Ratepayers that, Alliance might like to pick it up. You know, this might be something for them to have a look at about, you know, why don't have a, have a ask Aucklanders, do they want rates capped at the rates of inflation? And if so, you know, what does that mean? I mean, that's what I think the mayor should do is call the bluff on some of these, mm. you know, uh, silly, frivolous councillors like Richard Hills and Chris Darby who seem to vote against the wishes of the, the members of, you know, their constituents in North Shore. I mean, a, a bunch of wetter wombles I've never met. And uh, these two idiots want to spend more money than, you know, even Croesus had. It's unbelievable the things that they push and, and wring their hands over. Uh, and I'm sure that the constituents of North Shore, uh, for some reason, are aghast at this, but, but also keep returning these fools back to council. Yeah, I guess at the end of the day, the public just want to see... You know, the, the the word I get is like when when I ring up the Auckland Council, why can't I get access to somebody? Why can't yeah. I know who it is I'm talking to, and why can't they be accountable to seeing my problem right through to the end um, and resolving my issue? I'd say eighty percent of the calls I get are calls of frustration because they've hit the red tape. They call me yeah. and say, "What doors can you open for me, Greg, and help?" And probably eighty percent of the time I can, but not always. But you know, it's just that whole customer service, reliability, a person, you know, person ability, or who am I talking to? You can't actually identify anybody to talk to. And the frustration builds when you try and find information. It's not on websites, or mm. there seems an over reliance on call centers and websites and those sorts of things. Um, you know, there was a time when you wanted a building permit, you knew who the building inspector was. Now yeah. it's sort of someone that, Random guy with a with a clipboard who may or may not turn up. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, these are serious issues, and and you know, I I don't envy you the job of trying to actually navigate through all of these. Well, you do. But look, one one another idea that is, uh, and I, the mayor hasn't been the supportive of it. Is trying to do it himself or internally through those committees you talked about a little bit earlier. But having an independent performance auditor. Who comes in and will hold, will have, they're not accountable to, they're funded by the council, but they only report to the ratepayers of Auckland. And they have a, they would have an independent assessment of how Auckland Council is going. And they would report in the press what their findings were. That would hold not only uh, the bureaucrats to greater account, but also elected members to greater account. So they, uh, um, I'm very, very keen to have an independent performance order to type role put into place, but that, it doesn't look like it will happen this term. 
you know, I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? Is that it's the counselors that always get held to account when in actual fact, it seems that it's the officers of the council that are the ones that are the roadblocks to any progress or any sensible, you know, reforms that are happening. But they never seem to be held to account. And I'm not sure how you can do that and help hold them to account. Certainly, I don't think anybody ever gets sacked from the council. Maybe yes. maybe if they had their hand in the till or up the wrong person's skirt, they might get sacked. But, you know, for actually gross incompetence, you, 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 they don't seem to get sacked. Well, Penny Bright, the colourful character that she was, you know, and mm. was on the right track, I think, in terms of that transparency of Auckland's books. Yeah. So smart people that are out there in the community can go through line by line and actually ask those type of questions. That'd be that kind of uh, transgressed into that role of that um, independent performance auditor. But without that transparency, that how can it be held to account by ratepayers if they can't get into the books? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's a key point. I mean, Penny Bright and I had Donny Brooks in the past, uh, you know, but in many respects, she was one of those brave people who had some principles and stood for them. Mm. And it might have been slightly wonky in her crusades and in those things, but mm. it takes all types to make the world go round. And, you know, I, I admire her bravery and her grit yeah. when she did those things, you know. And you know, I still remember, you know, even John Banks going and visiting her when she That's was right. uh, on her last legs. And uh, that just shows the humility of John Banks and the caring of John Banks that many people don't see that I've seen up close. Yeah. But, you know, they were implacable enemies when it came to dealing with things in the council, yet the compassion shown when, when she was um, passing away was incredible. Well, look, her heart was in the right place about uh, wanting a voice for ratepayers. And I think, you know, I, I know what you're talking about there, Cam, but I think at the heart of it, you know, was opening the books so yeah. people could see, particularly around contracts. Yep. She's very hot on those, you know, things you have to see. I can't, I can't, have never been able to get my hands on, despite, you know, asking consistently, even the Official Information Act requests of copies of our contracts that we have with those preferred suppliers. And yeah. you know, you've, got this, you've got this ferry debacle at the moment with Gulf Harbour ferry service that seems to be running down, running down, running down, and uh, you know, uh, controlled by fullers. And, uh, we can't get a third party to have another crack at it saying, look, well, we'll step in tomorrow and take it over because they, apparently that contract's written in such a way that that's, that option isn't there. So, uh, Well, I mean, I know what it was like battling Fuller's when we had the contract to clear, uh, you know, uh, boat ramps and loading ramps and stuff around Manukau City. And we had you know, interference in the contracts all the time with Fuller's who, you know, because of their contracts and the contractual obligations of the council to those contracts could actually shut down access to boat ramps at any given time. Mm. People aren't aware of these sorts of things that are there that are essentially protecting a monopoly. Mm. Uh, and it's being protected by ratepayers money. Well, I hope you have a chat to Ken Turner about this or he's able to come on your show too, Ken, because he's doing an outstanding job in terms of asking those questions. He's a great. He's a, a breath of fresh air and around the council table. Yeah, uh, you know, asking those exactly those type of things. You know, um, if I can just come back, <laughs> it might be the third time I've done it, but you know, the, the, the trust of Aucklanders and Auckland Council. Well, Phil Goff promised it was running at about seventeen percent from memory. He said, "Oh no, we'll get this up. You know, we'll increase it." Well, I think it's sitting about twenty percent when, when he left, and it hasn't improved much under the current mayor. Because of all these things that we've discussed, it's a bit of a doom and gloom uh, uh, blog for you. But it's, uh, I think your listeners should have a degree of hope and that the mayor is, uh, he doesn't get on with, with everybody and he can rub people up the wrong way. That's just because he'll call a spade a spade. And some people might take that the wrong way. I've never had an issue with him. I, you know, he'll call the press strongos and he might call some councillors uh, idiots. You know, they, they might find that not very endearing or even alienating or arrogant, but at least you know where you stand. And we, there is somebody in there pushing hard to try and fix Auckland in the way that people elected them to do it. Uh, and, you know, that has, I haven't seen that under the previous previous years of Auckland. No, I mean, Lynn Brown was hopeless. He was more interested in goings on in the Nati Fatua room. Mm. And, of course, Phil Goff was just a career bureaucrat who just, 
oversaw a decline in Auckland City to the, such the extent where we're no longer a first world city and we're approaching a situation where the streets uh, around the city uh, resemble the streets of Suva and Fiji, which I know all too well about. And, uh, you know, SUVs seem to be the car of choice these days, but it's kind of needed in Auckland well, to drive is, around the roads. <laughs> isn't that true? Isn't it so disappointing to go down uh, to downtown Auckland these days and just see the state of it? Um, you certainly, certainly don't want to be down there at night. Well, no, on, I mean... On your you own. Know, yeah. no, no, exactly. I mean, I'm just talking about the infrastructure, mm. you know, that that is appalling. A classic case is a road here in, uh, you know, in Takapuna that you come off the motorway and you kind of zoom up there to Anzac Street, uh, you, you know, go along Barry's Point Road. The road surface is cratering. It's crocodiling. Uh, they're gonna. They've got the cones out ready to do the dig out to fix it, and it's about eight or nine hundred meters of the of the whole road. I envisage that's going to take weeks and weeks and weeks of massive road works to repair it. But all of the issues on that road are clearly because of the type of uh, you can see from the damage that's on the road. It's not from the trucks or the cars using it. It's from ingress of water under the surface of the road. That's what's caused it. And this is the thing that I find frustrating, knowing this stuff because of what I did in the past, yeah. that this was all preventable. Mm. You know, if you f rapidly fix potholes, if you rapidly fix dig outs, if you rapidly fix cracks in the surface of the road, then you can extend the life of the road 10, 15 years. And, and if you fix them according to the transit specifications, which is they're supposed to be doing, but they're clearly not because, you know, they're not crack sealing, they're not stopping the ingress of water. So they they go and do a rudimentary repair on a pothole and that pothole is just going to reappear because they haven't stopped water getting in there in the first place. And so you've got this lack of maintenance that has lent now to, I would imagine, a multi-billion dollar deficit in our road surfaces and repairs that needs to be addressed, and we don't have the resources to do it. Cam, would you? I'd be interested in your take on it, but I, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll just speak directly about it. But it's, my experience has been that if you look at the uh, funding for public transport versus the funding for roads, I think there's at least a six-fold difference in those budgets, and I think that actually, you know, Auckland Transport. Gets half of its funding from Waka Kotahi. Yeah. And Waka Tahi gets its direction about where that money should go from the Minister of Transport. And that uh, has, that's clearly been a directive to spend more money on public transport, road safety. So, yes, road safety and cycleways, right? So yeah. you've got to rob Peter to pay Paul. So it's come out of the roading budget. So uh, you know, I think just just to add a, some balance to to what you're saying there, I think if you spoke to those Auckland Transport roading engineers, they'd say, "Yeah, we know it needs to be done. We know we have those specs that you talked about, but the, the money just isn't there and sitting in their budgets to be able to do it because it's they've just shrunk, shrunk, and shrunk." And that's the key area, isn't it? Because if you don't spend it on maintenance, eventually you will spend it. Absolutely. If, um, if you're not, if you're not the, can, can I? Sorry, mate. Just to just kind yes, of, right. I don't mean to override you there, but you know, it's really, really important that any organisation, Auckland, Auckland Council in particular, which uh, and we control, we have the Treasury, mm. uh, which looks after Auckland Transport and Water Care's uh, debts. Now, if you're not funding for depreciation, so you can go in and do those jobs when they're required then you're, you're slipping further and further. Well, they call it sweating the assets, right? So you you just don't do the work and put it off for another year. That's what we're seeing. There's far too much. We've got to be at full 100% appreciation. The council's working to try and achieve that in the next few years. But uh, if you yeah, don't That's do a that, huge issue, depreciation. And I remember John Banks uh, in, the, in the days of Auckland City deferring depreciation, essentially robbing the kitty that would be used yeah, uh, to fix things up later. Because that's what depreciation is all about. It's about it's about replacing the asset in the lifetime of the asset, and putting money aside, but rating that so they could spend money on other things. Which meant that the sewage system wasn't um, upgraded. It meant to, uh, you know, roading wasn't upgraded, curbing wasn't done properly, all because those funds that were set aside, you know, ostensibly to replace those assets, 
uh, were robbed so that other projects could be funded. Yeah, but that, that anticipated cost, you can't really do, whoops, there's the dog. You can't actually do that and uh, be a viable business in my mind. Uh, and by business, I mean responsible of ratepayers' money. Yeah. But, but look, in terms of, the, you know, so those are, as I mentioned, costs you can anticipate and you should be managing that. And there's, a, you know, the governing body of Auckland Council should be overseeing that. But there have been a number of unexpected costs that we haven't talked about, Cam, and they've hit us this year. You know, the sure. school and the CRL, a billion bucks coming out of another billion bucks coming out, you know, and we, we have to come up with half of that, 500 million you know, overnight. Goodness knows what that's going to blow out to. Wow, That's exactly. A, mm. So you're one year down in your three years. Mm. Give us a few bullet points about what you'd like to see happen in the next two years leading into the next election. Well, uh, it seems so fundamental in my mind. It's you know, got to stop the wasteful, unnecessary spending. You've got to get council back to the core business. We talked about a little bit earlier. You've got to remove the red tape and the hurdles that we're talking about in terms of those extra costs that, and delays that Aucklanders are running into when they're trying to deal with Auckland Council. Is there anything else in particular that you want to focus on in the next two years? Well, for me, you know, as I said, I'm there to represent the people that put me in there. So I've, I've, I want to ensure that those gravel roads we talked about and the water tables that you referred to yep. are dramatically increased from the state that they are now. I want to see the... the uh, People not building in flood areas and getting flooded, which is happening now. I want to see the rivers cleared of the debris and council responsibility there. Private landowners also have a responsibility and need to come to the party there. Um, we have a job as Auckland Council to educate them to do that. But I think as long as elected officials listen to the people and represent their people's wishes, because Aucklanders know what needs to be done and they voice it. It just needs to get done. Yeah. That's exactly right. It needs to get done. Yeah. Well, on that note, uh, Greg, I think, you know, I've used up more than enough of your time. It's uh, yeah. <laughs> You can go off and do some more constituency issues. And now I, th I thank you uh, for coming on the crunch, and uh, we'll get you back on as the term progresses to mark progress. Great, Cam. Look, I really appreciate the opportunity, and I, I really uh, am grateful, I think, on behalf of many people that we've got this alternative media that we can go to and be able to have these conversations and people who want to listen can listen. Yeah, well, that's what we're here for. And we're here to provide the reality check for a lot of people as well. Yeah, good one. All right. It's been a pleasure, Cam. Thank you very much. No worries. Thanks, Greg. Honestly, I don't think there's enough time in the world to get through all that is wrong with Auckland Council. What is clear is that hardworking councillors like Greg Sayers and Ken Turner seem to be ankle tapped by the council bureaucracy. Something needs to be done, but what that is, is anybody's guess. Don't forget to send comments on Greg's interview to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. You've heard the words open, fair, both sides of the story. It's easy to say them, but practicing them often seems like a bridge too far. New Zealand, it's time for a reality check. Reality check. RCR, Reality Check Radio. Rational discussion, common sense, and open debate for real. With me, Paul Brennan. You know, you just can't make this stuff up. You couldn't write the script. Veteran broadcaster Peter Williams. Where is the evidence they actually make a difference? It turns out that was a very fair question to ask. Taking on the mainstream, Chantel Baker. Mainstream media, as usual, in their little perch. The man who cares so much and whose background is for real, Rodney Hyde. The doctors don't believe them. They can't get ACC. They can't work. They're told it's all in their head. Along with a raft of contributors to inform, entertain and bring the truth back to New Zealand media. It's time for a reality check, all right. RCR, Reality Check Radio at www.realitycheck.radio. We've arrived. You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio. 
Now it's time for Cam's Buddies. This week we'll find out why they think New Zealand has become a nation of sissies and bigots. My producer has them all lined up and ready to go, so let's hear what Cam's Buddies have to say about why New Zealand is full of sissies and bigots. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Jack. How are you this afternoon? I'm very good, thank you, Cam. So I've decided to throw a curveball at you guys this week. I've been watching a few stories in the news about, you know, various different people who've gone in the media, talked about how they've lost $400,000, want the banks to get their money back. Uh, they don't take, seem to take any responsibility. We see all these kids that are talking about safe spaces and making sure their pronouns are right. And we're seeing increased level of bigotry from people like Toe Henry, who's declared that he's going to block anything that comes to his committee because a, a democratic vote at council didn't go the way he was. And I'm just wondering whether or not New Zealand has become a nation of sissies and bigots. Absolutely. And I even know why. Why is that? Well, I put it down to the emancipation of women. You're going to think I'm a misogynist by saying this, but I'm not. I'm only stating facts. In the 50s, Men and women would socialise by perhaps going out to dances, even at school. The schools would have dances. Men would be at one end of the hall. Women would be at the other end. If you had people around for dinner in the 50s, 60s and into the 70s, uh, there'd be men at one end of the table and women at the other. Then slowly but surely, women decided that this wasn't good. So it'd be boy, girl, boy, girl. Now, yep. it sounds very good, but um, unfortunately, men and women are wired differently. Um, women are parallel ported, men are serially ported. So we would sit up one end with a woman next to us and she would be having a conversation with three other women all at the same time. We men can only understand one conversation, so we'd never hear any of that. Plus, they didn't have a subject that would really be our kind of stuff. Men want to talk men stuff. Yeah. And slowly but surely, that's been weaned out of us. See, my personal hero is... Willie Appiata, a man yeah. amongst men. Never met him, but, you know, those type of people. But but really, if you said this to a woman, she'd go, ooh. And, uh, you know, they'd be wanting you to have more of, to use Paul's uh, um, word, a girly man <laughs> as a hero. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of men have bought into this. And they've been, women have slowly said that we might, uh, need to find our softer side. Well, we don't have a soft side. Well, I don't anyway. Um, we men, we think hard. and But now it's not kind of um, socially acceptable to be like that. We have to be nice, caring individuals. Well, we're not. That's just the way it is. So there's a lot of disaffected people now and sissies, as you call it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, in 1944, we had 18-year-olds charging off landing craft into machine gun nests, you know, uh, invading uh, France and liberating France from the Nazis. Nowadays, 18-year-olds don't know whether they're Arthur or Martha, and they need safe spaces and get horribly upset if you don't use their preferred pronouns, which are some nonsensical made-up words. Tell me about it. We had 19- and 20-year-olds flying um, heavy bombers in World War II. 550,000 of them died doing it, and that was their life, and they accepted that. Yeah. So so you actually think we have become sissified, to use a, a made-up word, now that I've just criticised made-up words? I don't, I'll think so. it up. I don't think so. I know so. Well, I'm only speaking about myself, but um, crikey, it's a different world from the 50s. We were hard men. I mean, I was in the first 15. We... Um, we got knocked around and so forth. There was none of this, um, you know, being sent off for high tackles or whatever. And I know, I understand, the, you know, the consequences of head knocks and so forth, but uh, we just got on with it. Yeah, I mean, Imagine just... uh, England trying to go to war now um, with, with all the soft people over there. They'd never win a battle. Yeah, and I, I think that the politicians have a lot to answer for because they've taught people, you know, from the creation of the welfare state that it's all right, the state will look after you, or it's all right, um, you know, we'll put some rules in place so people don't give you hurty words. Um, it's all right, um, they're there, uh, you know, here, have some government money. And I think it's turned us into a, into a nation of sissies. The bigotry, though, I can't and really also, work out. 
And also some men are now classified, I'm well, I suppose women as well, as bigots and so forth. And I think it's just rebelling against this state, as you call it, that um, wants us to conform to everything they do and say. And anyone that rebels against that in any form whatsoever has now referred to as being a bigot. Or racist or whatever. I mean, if you have a debate yes. about, if you yes. want to have a debate or a referendum about the Treaty of Waitangi, all of a sudden you get a whole bunch of people clamouring saying, well, this will lead to violence. And um, you better not do that because otherwise we'll get stroppy. Well, you know, back in the day when I was at school, if somebody uh, threatened you like that, you set them back on their ass. Well, you go around behind the bike sheds and sort it out. Yeah, I mean, you know, in the army, uh, we frequently sorted things out with NCOs and that took made them take their stripes off, step out the back of the barracks, have a set to, uh, sure. pick each other up off the ground, wipe the blood off, uh, and then go and have a beer and everything was sorted. And some may say that that's barbaric, but in fact, that's the way it should happen. Imagine in the world of animals, you know, the male lion just sits there, the female does everything, but if there's any trouble, the male comes up and eats somebody or something and deals with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, that's the thing about blokes, isn't it, is that we might have a, a blue or a Donnybrook with our mates, but we'll still sit down uh, and have lunch with them or dinner with them and carry on regardless. And that blue's forgotten about yep. five seconds after we've had the argument. We generally don't hold grudges. Women do hold grudges. Um, but uh, we've been feminised to a point where, I don't know, I'm constantly being told at work, you can't say that. And I go, why can't I say that? It's my place. Oh, no, you might offend someone. Well, who cares? No, well, nobody cares. The only Offence can only be taken. It can't be given. That's my view. True. I love that. Can I use that? Yeah, you can use that any time, Jack. Um, but you, you know, you're right. You know, kids come home from school and they say, oh, you know, such and such said mean things to me. He's bullying me. And and what the parents do is go, oh, no, that's terrible, little Johnny or Sebastian or Monica or whatever. And then they go up to the school and complain when what they really should be saying to their kid is, you know, the thing that we were brought up with, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And don't worry about it. He's a dick. And just deal with it. Yeah. But no, no, everything's forever. Every, yeah, everything's called bullying now, and now and now there has to be an outcome. And usually the outcome is the person who was being bullied gets moved. Yeah, and in this case into being a, a, uh, an MP in the national government. But anyway, that's another story. No, well, they, they move into being a sissy, having their, having their <laughs> mummy defend them all the time. Yes, I know. All right, well, you're, in, a, going you, on this. you're agree, in agreement. You think that we have got too many sissies and bigots out there and uh, people just need to get a life and uh, harden up. Yeah, get on with it. Yeah. Harden up. Just All up right, Jack. Look. Get on with it. Thanks for your call. Good talking to you. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. G'day, Cam. Hey, Jimmy, how are you? How are you this week? Oh, I'm, I'm very well, thank you, sir. No, all good. I've got a bit of a curveball for you. I've uh, just talked to Jack and uh, put the proposal that um, I'm wondering whether New Zealand has become full of sissies and bigots and what's caused that? Well, it has definitely become a big sissy country and just the constant closing of the Harbour Bridge that never used to close is just one indicator of this. Yeah. The I put it down to... Arden just continually scaring everyone, and now everyone just lives in a panic state about everything all the time. Yeah, you know, I mean, the other day they uh, had, you know, wind warnings and, you know, lane closures on the Harbour Bridge. I went over the Harbour Bridge. They said that, you know, you had to drive at 50. There was barely a breeze, <laughs> and everyone's crawling right. along like this. It was the end of the world. Either they're not telling us something about the bridge or transit's run by a bunch of sissies. Well, it's not just that. It's all sorts of things, you know. There's just, just Something's seriously gone wrong with this country in the last three years, and I, I really put it down to the COVID mentality just changed our, our psychology because we were such a can-do country. Now we just can't even get the permission to do stuff. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? We, we were a can-do country where <laughs> guys did amazing feats. You look at Charles Upham, you look at Willie Appiata. These guys aren't sissies. You'd be hard no, pressed, pressed to find anybody who would go charging into machine gun nests these days. They'd, they'd probably ask for, you know, the enemy to respect their pronouns and provide some safe spaces for them. <laughs> well, I was just reading about Sir Tim Wallace, 
and his feet's back in the sort of seventies of the, in the helicopter de- live deer catching. Like <laughs> they would seem mad doing that at the start. They wouldn't be allowed to do it now. No, it'd be insane. So, it was, but it's like bungee jumping when they first started doing that. I'm sure there was people <laughs> having kittens about that these days. Nowadays, it's perfectly safe. <laughs> There's no risk. Yeah. So I, look, I, I, I honestly don't know what has caused it, but it, we need to stop it because it's just so unproductive. I guess maybe the I think there's a thing called Parkinson's that um, it's, it's like a study of how bureaucracy naturally grows, right? Um, yeah, and I think maybe the bureaucracy's just got so big in this country that you got bureaucrats trying to make work all over the show. So it's easy for them to slow people down on the bridge, and they don't get fired because there's no accidents. But if they didn't do it, then there was somehow an accident attributed to the wind then they would, you know, potentially lose their job. So we just get bureaucracy laid on us all over the show for people with their job protection. Yeah, that's Parkinson's law. That's the observation that the duration of public administration, bureaucracy and officialdom expands to fill its allotted time span, regardless of the amount of work to be done. Yeah. And so we've probably hit that point with a giant bureaucracy between Auckland Council and central government. It's just, it's just crippling everything. Well, Jack seems to think it, it all started when we gave women the vote and and, and said that they had an equal <laughs> voice. Now, yeah, I'm not sure that's going to – I'm pretty sure that's going to get me a lot of comments on the show about that. But, um, you know, th- there is an argument to be made about the feminization of society, uh, especially in the teaching in, you know, industry. Uh, you know, most teachers are women now. There's not very many male teachers we seem to have lost that Kiwi blokedom that's out there, that can-do attitude that allowed us to invent things, do dangerous things, do all these things. And we've, we're bringing up a generation or, or multiple generations that are progressively getting softer and weaker. And it, it just astonishes me the number of people who contact the media because someone's ripped them off or someone was mean to them or any number of complaints and things, you know, culminated in one thing that I I noticed during the Women's Soccer World Cup where there was a fire alarm at Eden Park and this guy was on TV saying it it was ringing for ages and no one told us what to do. (laughs) Well, you know, that's just... Have you ever read The Coddling of the American Mind? No, perhaps I should. You should. It talks about the, the, the Western democracies slowly getting softer and coddling and we're going to create a society so weak men create bad times mate The Coddling of the American Mind a book by Greg Lukianov and Jonathan Haidt I'll I'll bookmark that one and I think I'll have to get that on the Kindle and have a read That basically talks about this sort of softening of our societies like there's just no way America the great America of the 1950s could be built today just not possible Well you look at the things that we did yeah, look at the things we did in the past. You know, um, we built roads and through terrible terrain. We get a bit of rain, the wash, the the road washes away, and here we are, ten months later, still no road. In the old days, just we were just for consent. <laughs> yeah, we, we would have just bulldozed all the rubbish off the off the side of the road and built a new one, and it would have been done in a month. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, on yeah, now you just can't even you, you can't get consent, let alone start the actual road. Yeah, and they're worried so about snails and, you know, birds and things like that. No, no, we've got to do this. Hello, we live in st- – we're the masters of this society, not animals and snails and things and frogs and coloured frogs and, you know, secret tadpoles or something that nobody's ever heard of. Well, I think there is a place to protect our, our nature. Like, you, But a critical juncture is damaged and we have to fix it massively fast. Yeah. So there is in, in, instances where we have to protect the species, but – so it's not completely bad, but yeah, I think if you just add all those stuff together, Ken, that's where our society is getting soft. And I don't think it's just a New Zealand problem. I think it's a Western democracy problem. It's pretty obvious. Yeah, yeah I mean, you look at back so at the, old, the old the old pioneer days, you know, where we were breaking in bush and turning it into pasture and all of that. They wouldn't do it now because oh no, you've got to have health and safety breaks and you know, a cup of teas here oh, yeah. and when we wouldn't be driving oxen. Bike through the forest to try and create a trail. It'd be terrible. No, we need to have we need to have we need to have a, a team of oxen to go ahead with a bell warning people that there's a group of people coming through cutting a track, you know? Yeah, no, like the 
it's just a lot of stuff now we have we just couldn't we wouldn't be allowed to rig like I don't think you'd get consent to build a Clyde Dam now, for example. Yeah. Well we seem to be able to build stupid wind you know, bird shredding wind farms. <laughs> bird choppers. <laughs> <laughs> That seems to be okay, but, but you yeah, want, to build, I, want to build a dam on? Oh, no, we can't do that. Yeah, so that's it's just all part of it. Yeah, appalling. So we, I think then also we listen to too many grieved people over everything. Ah, oh, so people moan about everything. Oh, he used dirty yeah, words. Yeah, yeah, no matter what. Yeah, oh, they so, believe yeah. me. Well, give him a hiding. That, that's how we dealt with it at school. If he had a bully, you went and got a bigger bully to beat up the bully. End of problem. <laughs> Yeah, I think when you went to school in the seventies and eighties, it's changed a lot. Yeah, I mean, we used to get caned, so, you know. Well, you know, I always talk yeah, myself out of it. Strapped. But, yeah, I mean, I remember <laughs> when I got strapped in standard four. It was they they called it back then, whatever year it is now. Come up with some cockamamie idea, and this teacher was there, and she was lining up everyone in the class that was going to get strapped, and she was saying, you know. I was brought up on a farm and we used to trim the hedges with sickles and my arms are really strong, so I'm going to really strap you hard. And she went on and on and on for 20-odd minutes, you know, telling us how hard she was going to hit us. And then it turned out to be somewhat softer than that and kind of we lost respect for her then. We were hoping we were going to get the right old bash, but no, it never happened. Imagine if she did that in today's schools. Oh, some kid would be filming it. It would be on TikTok or or, or Instagram or something, and then there'd be an out, outraged article in the Herald written by some spotty 13-year-old masquerading as a journalist. And then a woke, angry mob outside the school. <laughs> oh, no, no they'd, they'd probably blacklist them on something or boycott some supplier to the school to make sure that this bully of a... T- you know, this is the sort of stuff that carries. The people who complain about bullies become the biggest bullies. That is true. Well, well that's my take on that subject, Cam. It's, it's a, I think you've probably going to stir up a few people on on your show today. With well, I only, I only had one negative comment in the mailbag last week, so I thought I'd up my game a bit. <laughs> okay. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Good afternoon, Paul. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. Good morning, Cam. How are you? Yeah, all good. Hey, um, I've got to pose a question to uh, Jack and Jimmy. It's your turn now. Um, do you think New Zealand has become full of sissies and bigots, and why do you think that has happened? Um, I think there's a lot of sissies because very few people are prepared to stand up for what they believe, regardless of the belief. For example, if you're a Christian and you say to someone, oh, I'd like to ask a blessing on the food, um, everybody seems to say, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. But many Christians won't do that, and I view them to be sissies because... Why would you not do that? If you like, I'm always thankful to my God for all the blessings that I seem to be getting. So I think that's a, that's a good thing to, to give thanks and give it often. And also, um, you see, if you many people can't use the um, the Hershey's pronoun of he she, yeah, um, or her she, um, and I look and I think. Why can't you do that? Why, why do you want to be someone who... Because when anyone says to me, what are your preferred pronouns? I always give them like a, an answer like, always right, or I told you a more so. manly man than you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, um, and so as such, I look at these people and I think, why are you concerned so much about what other people think? And yet when you see someone about to assault someone... Many of these folk aren't there. I remember a few times at work, and this is just a, um, a passing story, but a few times at work, um, someone came in threatening people. I stood up, went straight over to see what the problem was, mm. and a number of folk would be hiding down the back. <laughs> On a different occasion, you were there, and you were right beside me, and I'm thinking, well, we weren't necessarily going to win, but we had more of a chance with you backing me up like you weren't going to run. So I then viewed, regardless of our um, prowess to win or lose, that a mate sticks up for a mate. Whereas that doesn't happen as much these days for some reason. Well, I mean, and then I know. see... Um, yep, carry on. I see our doctors and um, they, they're saying um, jobs before truth. 
Yeah. And I'm thinking jobs before truth. Um, what about the Hippocratic Oath or whatever it's called that says, I will do no harm? Mm. And then when we have safe, the word safe, safe and effective safe, that word safe, yeah. means not, it, it's not a, a little bit of harm or it's not a, a relative scale. That's a factual thing. If you look at the definition of safe, yep. it means it will do no harm. So here we are told by every man and his dog and all the media, and, and it just kept filtering down, safe and effective for something that's not safe and, and, and turns out not effective either. But that, that sort of thing, and, and all manner of people would believe this because they were sissies. Like, oh, I don't want to. I don't want to lose my job. You'd rather lose your life than your job. Hello. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just you, thought, you talk about that mates issue, and we've both got a mate who uh, had a rather public meltdown, and everyone ran for cover, and it was you and I that were picking up the pieces. Yes. And, and I mean, I got so him out of questions. the loop, <laughs> yeah, you, you got him out of the loony bin. You got him away from the media. I was the first person to go vin- visit him in the loony bin, uh, you know, when nobody else could get there. But here's the thing, right, is that plenty of other people who would call him their mates, including some of the people he used to work with, ran, turned around, and it was, no, it was Nigel no mates all of a sudden. Well, it, do- it doesn't matter what a mate has done. You stand by a mate, thick and thin. That's why they're mates in my book. And that seems to be sadly missing in society these days. Well, I agree with you wholeheartedly there. I look at many people. Like, I have a friend policy that says, you're my friend. If you're my friend, you can't get rid of me as a friend because I want to be a better friend than you could hope for. And, and I, I learned this on some show about a bloke that was a spy. And um, all his mates didn't like him because they thought he'd turn on the other side. But he was, in fact, a, a double spy. And so he was really doing work for um, the, the Five Eyes type thing. And as such, one bloke said, I don't understand you, but you've always been my mate. And uh, I'll, one day we'll sit down and chat this through, but I'm still your mate. And I thought, that's the kind of mate I want to be. That's the kind of friend I want to be and have and so when um whenever like people have called me a friend and then um taken hundreds of thousands of dollars off me and um with no real intention of paying it back and Mm. i've thought um well that's normally deserving of a no friend status but they're still my friends that's not that's not deserving of a no friend status that means they obviously had a desperate need much more than me, and thought that 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 was an okay thing to do, even though they um, they weren't keen on it. And then I guess it's part and parcel of that um, putting hot coals on your head um, analogy, whereby if you repay a bad deal with kindness, people feel much worse about it. And and often, as you remember in the in the schoolyard, mm. um, most of your best mates came from an argument. You smash them in the face a couple of times, or they you. And yeah. then your best of buddies because it's it's cleared the air and oh, okay you're not that or you are this or whatever. Whereas I think often in and I say this to be really sexist, men will bash you and it will heal shortly. Mm. Women will character assassinate you and it will never heal. Yeah, I mean that's the thing, and you know I've learned that from you as well. The the comment about trying to be the best mate that you can be or the best mate that that person's got despite what they may do or say or anything about you. And, you know, that's one thing that I've admired about you immensely, Paul, your ability to smile and box on, even though some people have done some terrible things or said terrible things about you, you you just carry on. And, you know, you see them interacting with you like nothing's ever happened. And uh, I always wonder what goes on in their head, and but I know what's going on in your head, and, and you've shared that with me many, many times. And it's just been really, really, really good advice. And I think that, that our country has become sissified and has become intolerable and awful as a result. And I don't really know how to do anything about that other than to continue being mates with my mates and, and standing up for the things I believe in and not being a sissy. I like that as well, but I think what we really have to do is that I'm, I'm on a school board and I've been on 
school boards for 30 years, but I'm on a school board, and I try and point through that rules are not flexible suggestions. And if we say this is going to occur, then it occurs. And so that we give kids boundaries. Yes. And if we say, um, and, and one thing I like about Luxon, which was not a sissy idea when a few of us may have been, was that Luxon said no phones in schools if he gets in charge. And yeah. I like that because I, I think, and then we can have a rule like no phones in schools. And then if there's breaches of that, the the problem can be escalated. So for for um, confiscation, for getting parents involved, for whatever. And and I like the fact that we've got um, the at least the the potential prime minister saying that's one thing. And and I think if we can get some of these disciplines happening in school, that yes is yes and no is no, and there's not a whole lot of oh but miss oh but sir oh. And, and all this caving into pressure, then we can perhaps get the, because it's going to take 30 or 40 years to get the kids through and out and growing their kids away from some of the sissy behaviour. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Boundaries are important. You know, I can remember when I was a scout leader in Wellington, we'd have our camps and um, you'd get the kids come up on a Thursday night before the camp on the weekend. They'd say, oh, look, um, I've got soccer in the morning on Saturday. Can I come out on Saturday afternoon? And I'd just say, no, you can't. You either come on Friday or not at all. And they'd say, oh, but, sir, oh, but, you know, and their parents would then wheedle away at you. And I'd say, no, no, the, the camp program starts Friday night and it goes all the way through to Sunday afternoon. If little Johnny comes out halfway through Saturday, it's disruptive um, the teamwork that was built, um, you know, over the previous night and the activities in the morning is destroyed. So the answer is no. Little Johnny has to choose. You can either go to your sissy soccer or you can come to a camp where we're going to build bridges and, you know, knock things over and blow things up. You choose. <laughs> Learn some survival skills. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know what? Every time they chose the camp because it was better than being a sissy at soccer. Mm. And another thing I think is parents have got a bit to answer for in this sissy behaviour because our men are not being mean. First of all, many of our men are leaving the family situation during the formative years of the children mm. and they're not present. But the ones that are present um, leave some of the discipline to mum or they're acting um, less than they could be as men. Whereas I'm a firm believer is as men, we've got a, a role model or a role to model that our young people can learn and, and so that any of the young people that were um, at the scout type camps that I was a um, leader of, if they spoke with a tone to their parents in front of me, I indicated very clearly that it was inappropriate speech mm. and it embarrassed some of the parents and some of the parents said to me, I don't like the way you're talking to my boy. And I said, I don't like the way he's talking to you either. But, hey, if you wish to take him away from the camp, you're welcome to, but this is how we do things here. And one father said, oh, I think I'll take him out. And his son said, oh, Dad, please don't. We have so much fun. And yeah. it was the discipline. And we weren't sitting around, you know, being silly. We were doing things like lighting fires and, cooking food and killing food to cook and things like that that were just a bit more interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, my final thought, I guess, would be, uh, you know, people often say, you know, what would Jesus do or what would Jesus say? And I always look at Jesus a little bit differently from most people because I always thought he was actually a tough guy and he hung around with tough guys and he did tough things. I mean, I don't think he would have cleared out the temple by using sissy words and saying, look, guys, could you please you know, cut, cut out doing this? This is a little bit annoying, uh, and it's really going against God's will here. Um, or did he show them the crazy eye and get his tough guys that were around him to make it clear that these guys better move? That's the Jesus that um, I like. Well I, know, well, I know that most fishermen are not sooks. There's yeah. no sissies in the, the fishing man's army, so to speak. Yeah. And and I've had a policy of there'll be no sooks in this man's army. And even though I know that that's a tongue-in-cheek suggestion, <laughs> there's a lot of truth in it. <laughs> but I think Jesus hung around with tough blokes. Yeah. And he tamed them and made them, like any that when someone's given trouble that he's 
or a centurion, and one of your main men goes and rips his sword out and cuts off his ear, you know these aren't sissies. No, that's right. Maybe we need to be more like that. Thanks for your call. Thanks. Have a good day. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Miles. Good morning, Cam. How are you? I'm good, mate. Hey, I've got a question for you. All the others have uh, answered. You're the last man standing, and I mean man in the in the true truest sense of the term, because there's no sooks in this man's army, as Paul just said. Correct. I'm concerned that our nation has become a, a nation of sissies and bigots. Do you agree with that? And how do you think that's happened? Well, I kind of think we're well down the sissy road, and I see this. In TV adverts, I see a lot of absolutely puerile TV adverts where the guy or the man or the partner is made to look like an absolute numpty and is incapable of doing even the simplest job. And guess what? I'm not impressed. I won't buy those products. Yeah. You know, um, We've been hunting a fair bit, and we've taken your daughter hunting. She's no sissy. Yep, yep. No. She can take the back wheels off a goat and whip out the back stakes almost as uh, well as I can, so I'm pretty pleased with that. Yeah, we've done some pretty hard stuff, and uh, she's been there, you know, donkey deep with us, uh, carrying the carcasses out in the cold and the dead of the night, uh, freezing cold and that. And uh, she's no sissy, but then neither you or, or your missus are sissies either. Well, I look around and I see some truly appalling examples of people who are sissies. And um, I just, sometimes I just, it just breaks my heart. Uh, I mean, you know, it's all very well seeing a um, car on the side of the road and a lady with a spare tyre who simply can't get the um, the lug nuts off the uh, tyre because they're jackhammered on. Yeah. But it's a whole nother thing to see a bloke standing there not even knowing what to do or how to change a, a spare tyre. And by yeah. a bloke, I'm talking about a guy, a young guy, who, in my humble opinion, should damn well know better. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? Because, like, you know, you're a military historian. You're, a, a, you know, into antique arms and stuff. And, uh, you know, we look at history and look at the at the – particularly World War II, some of the heroism that was displayed by, you know, people like Charles Upham. We look at Willie Appiata, of course, in more recent times. And, you know, in 1944, 18-year-olds were charging into machine gun nests and artillery and, you know, hardened German soldiers uh, at 18. Nowadays, most 18-year-olds can't work out whether they're a well, boy they couldn't or a even cook their own. Yeah, they couldn't even cook their own dinner, let alone know what sex they are. Mm. I mean... I'm not sure, you know, where the um, train has come off the rails, but it sure has come off the rails. And, you know, we can't be all things to all people. Um, men, for better or for worse, do things that um, are much more practical. They do things with their hands. Uh, they like to help. I'm, I'm that kind of guy, but I see with absolute amazement how, you know, whole groups of kids, well, they don't want to get their hands dirty. They just want to go to university and come straight out of university and earn $100,000 a year and, and have a nice life. And and when something goes wrong in their house, you know, I, I was going to say change a light bulb, but perhaps I shouldn't be that cruel. Um, you know, perhaps something a little bit more major, like, I don't know, the fuse blows or the circuit breaker blows. How many people know how to change an old style fuse or even where the circuit breakers in their house are, are located? I no, mean, no. you can always fix an old, old style fuse with a, with a paper clip if you don't want it to, yeah. if you don't want it to blow. <laughs> <laughs> not to be, not to be recommended. <laughs> but I mean, then it there's my like firewood. I mean, I cut, I cut my own firewood and and split my own firewood. But to your own I can animals. tell you this: it's a, yeah, and it's a hell of a lot easier to get it delivered. But 
you know, there's a, there's a lot of enjoyment. I mean, my um, father-in-law says uh, preparing wood, you get warm twice, once when you cut it and once when you burn it. Uh, so, abs- you know, absolutely. I, I think I think by sissy, I mean that a certain amount of life skills are gone. But, you know, I have to um, do an honourable mention to driving. I don't know what's happened to driving in this country, but good Lord, when I am on the open road and it's a, it's a comfortable road and it's easy to do 100k and I come across someone doing 80k because they've been frightened into submission by adverts and finger wagging and there's no reason for them to be doing 80k. I mean, the road conditions are fine. Good Lord, uh, how many accidents must they cause when people get frustrated? So, you know, there's a there's a, a bit of a nanny state going on as well, and that nanny state sort of cows people into, oh my God, I can't I can't be doing more than a hundred k. Perhaps I should be doing a lot less, safer, slower speeds, or some such. Um, Ballyhoo. I, I just simply can't believe it. Yeah, I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy, suggest, Jimmy suggested a bunch of sissies work at Transit New Zealand, and that's why the bridge gets closed when there's a bit bit of a gusty wind. Well, I, you know, I reckon that the winds haven't got any stronger since the 1960s, and, and we've had storms continually from, um, from that period through to now, and it's only just now that the... Um, Bridges are being closed, and, and and it makes me wonder: Do people have no brains? Do motorcyclists look outside and think, oh, "Golly, it's a windy day. Well, it won't affect me. I'll just uh, pop over the Harbour Bridge." I mean, goodness me, have people got no sense of personal responsibility anymore? Well, that's right. I don't think they do, and that's part of the problem, isn't it? There's no consequences for actions, and you know they can always run back to mummy to fix their problems and and carry on being sissies. Well, I reckon people look for someone to blame and the nanny state and someone to blame. It's it's not my fault, sir. I was driving because nobody told me I couldn't drive or it's not my fault, sir. Um, this tyre is a run flat and uh, but it's supposed to be able to be driven on. You know, right. it's always someone else's fault. Totally it's somebody else's fault. Man up. Take responsibility. Take the blame. Make sure that you... Uh, aware of the consequences of your actions, and if you're going to do something, you have to be um, prepared to accept the consequences. Exactly, and that's the problem that we've got in society. There's too many people who won't accept the consequences. Thanks for your call, Miles, and we'll talk next week. Thanks, Cam. Have a good one. As usual, my buddies are awesome. They never let me down, and they tell us the truth. Tell me who you thought was the best of Cam's buddies and why by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. RCR is on a mission to revive honest media and now you too can be an integral part of it by joining the RCR Foundation Members Club. Receive exclusive benefits only available to club members, including your own backstage pass to join the hosts for interactive behind-the-scenes discussions along with our all-new daily curated news summary, RCR Bytes, that's delivered to your email box every morning, keeping you on the pulse of the news that matters in just a few minutes per day. To find out more, visit realitycheck.radio members to see how you can join the mission that's making a difference. Making a difference. Making a difference. Our text machine is now live. Send us your thoughts by texting your message to 2057. That's 2057. So get in touch with us now. Right, now it's time for that fun time of the show where we get into the feedback in the mailbag. Here's some general feedback from last week. Your show's really good. It's between you and Brennan. Best Kiwi radio I've heard in 20 years. Well done. Thank you, Anonymous. Another Anonymous comment. uh, Hey, Cam, great show, great mates, great common sense. Could I recommend Ken Turner as a guest? 
West Auckland councillor. He will have a story of wanton waste for you. He's battling the bureaucrats for us, let alone what's happening out west. And Anonymous, we are here to please. We have indeed had Ken Turner on the show this afternoon. Catherine writes, Dear Cam, I love the crunch and the Friday political roundup, which you do on Paul's breakfast show. I've done a few interviews with Paul Brennan, and I hope you might have heard the most recent one played on 19th of October, in which I talked about governance and the power of the executive branch of the government. Your pre-election sessions were brilliant, realistic and honest. So sorry you've had to had such nasty stuff from NZ Loyal followers and the Fruit Loop hit job by Samantha on Counterspin. One can only hope that the resilience that you've had to develop through sheer hard personal experience will help you shrug this nonsense off. But I'm sure it was personally very gutting and it has also been very divisive for the VFF groups. Yeah, Catherine, I've got the height of a rhino and uh, I can take anything they serve up. I'm not worried about it at all. But thanks for your concern. And I got some comments on my monologue from last week, which was deeply personal, but you know, it's something that I like to share uh, with people from time to time on the anniversary. Uh, Anonymous writes, hi, Cam, just a thought. Did you look into worms, parasites? It could be eating your potassium. Keep up the good work and keep loving life. Life will love you back. Yeah, I take ivermectin fairly re uh, regularly, so I don't think I've got any worms or parasites. Linda writes, hello, Cam, I've just heard you on RCR. I've been a fan of your writing and was excited to hear you were going to be a regular on RCR. Thank you for sharing such a personal and heartfelt account of your journey from the day of your stroke to the present day. Your story is one of courage and determination. I was deeply moved by your telling of it. Would you possibly be able to list it separately to the rest of your show so that we may be able to share with, to a friend who has suffered a heart attack a few months back and would benefit from hearing it? I love the personal acumen you bring to RCR and wish you all the best of health in the future. Much happiness and a long association with my favorite radio station. Thank you so much, Linda, for those kind words. And yes, we've arranged to have that monologue uh, listed separately, which will appear in the app as soon as we can get it there. David writes, hi, Cam, just listened to you telling your guest how you came to smoke cigars. Bloody hilarious, smoking cigars shortly after a stroke. I pissed myself at the thought of allopathic drug pushers having an apoplectic fit seeing you do this. Keep it up. Stuart writes, well, Cam, thanks for sharing your experience from the last five years and giving us all an insight into how that changed you and your aspects on life. Isn't it interesting how such a dark time can create a place for such important transformations? And it sounds like you're a much more complete person now. Respect. I love listening each week to your show. It's potentially the best political show available in New Zealand at this time. Well, to be fair, it is the best. You and Marie Buskey are the best interviewers on the air in New Zealand on the best platform around. Keep up the amazing work. Your passion, experience, and vast knowledge comes through in spades. Jeanette writes, Hi, Cam. I loved your written piece about your life journey and the subsequent chat. Loved hearing how your faith was so integral into that journey. Thank you for sharing. Love to be able to pass on your story. Could it be made into a clip? Hopefully, Jeanette, the clip will be up. Now I've got a long one here from my best mate in Foxton, Mike. Oh, my God, Cam, I just heard what happened with your stroke. You had the same side effects as me. I had a stroke, but not as bad as you. But the two side effects I got that have remained were that I saw colors differently, more intense. And two, I can hear my cat walk on a carpeted floor. And like you, screaming children drive me mad. Years later, I worked as an aircraft refueler at Perth Airport in Western Australia, and before I started the job, I had to have a baseline hearing test, which typically takes 15 minutes. I was in the room for 45 minutes and was told when I finished the test that I had perfect hearing, apparently one in 200,000 who come through their doors. I was tested three times to make sure it was not me fluking at first or even the second time. I knew after the stroke that I was different and that my hearing was improved, but that test proved it. I also had the dropped face and slurred speech with weakness down the left side. One weird thing that when it happened, I had people at home putting up a steel garage I'd bought. 
These guys were not the sharpest knives in the drawer, but were good blokes. Each day, my wife would sit me in the chair before she went to work, and I'd sit there and watch the garage go up. I couldn't speak at the time, but still had a mind that worked, and I could see them making stupid mistakes, but couldn't do anything about it. When my wife came home every couple of hours, she would smile and speak, and I couldn't really answer her. On day three, I wouldn't let her move the chair to watch the guys, so that evening, I kind of got her to understand that I couldn't watch them anymore because of the mistakes they were making and the way they were going about things, so I spent the rest of my time not watching. I do remember a few months later, as I was coming right, I decided one day to make some savoury mints and veggies for dinner so she didn't have to cook when she got home. It took the whole day to prepare and cook this meal, and I was so sure it was going to be so nice on a cold winter's evening. Wrong. I had used sugar instead of salt, and it was not very nice, but to her credit, she sat there and forced it down, saying it was okay. I know it wasn't, because I wouldn't eat it. It took seven to eight months before I could function and speak properly again with the help of a therapist and my long-suffering wife. My wife was the one who gave me the incentive to get myself better, and without her, I could not have done so well. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate those comments. Now, I've got some negative feedback here from Susan about uh, my interview with Liam here. Dear Cam, please let let your interviewees do most of the talking. You tend to repeat your well-known opinions and impressive recovery story too often. Loyal RCR listeners, often foundation members, need to hear new people. Poor Liam made desperate snorkeling and snuffling sounds every time you dominated the microphone and wouldn't let him get a word in. Thanks, Susan. Appreciate that. Maybe I'll try and improve. Now, regarding the interview with Gary Moller. Hi, Cam. As always, I'm enjoying the crunch conversations. Read the submissions against parliamentary bills. Gary Moller is a valued health icon. While we know submissions have become a fait accompli, cannot forget the bored look on Zoom of the faces of those chosen to adjudicate COVID-19 Emergency Act extension, it is most certainly not a wasted gesture. It may feel ineffective, but still it has never been more important to speak out against injustice. And that's from Janet. Marlene says, Cam and Guest, you both speak too much sense. I don't think I can take it. It's unradio-like. RCR is great. Keep talking. And Linda says, 100% with you on this. Great conversation. How did so many people not see it? Yes, Winston is the real deal. Gary and Cam, you give me hope. Anne says, Cam, I'm listening to your interview with Gary Moller and I'm feeling very frustrated. Cam, you have so much knowledge, but please, please let Gary Moller tell his story. Remember, Cam, we're given two ears and one mouth. Well, Anne, it sounds like you listened to what I've said. We do indeed have two ears and one mouth, but these interviews are conversations and sometimes I have to talk. Patricia says, really enjoy listening to your talk with Gary Moller this evening. You make so much sense. The bits of health advice from Gary were also helpful. Thank you to all at RCR. As always, I love listening. And we've got another comment from Mike at Foxton. He's becoming my best pal. I might have to get him on as one of Cam's buddies. Mike, you know how to uh, send your contact details for that. We'll include you in Cam's buddies. I think you've earned that right. He says, Cam, I'm listening to your interview with Gary Moller and what an inspiring interview it has been. I'm not sure if I could go and join the National Party or Worm Tongue Seymour's party, but I'm going to get involved with New Zealand First on a local level. Maybe hard because I really want to grow the local Otaki VFF team, but I'll get in touch with Velma Vermeulen and have a word with her to see what I can do to help. This is the best of the crunch so far, so it's going to be hard to raise the bar any further in my opinion. Well done, Cam, and keep up the great work. And we've got a comment from Facebook from Tracy, Gary Moller, the voice of wisdom and reason. And Graham writes, on this Thursday's interview with Graham, Gary Moller, you made a comment that you'd not managed to contract COVID, and this was probably because of dietary and other positive health factors. I'd venture that the answer to your lack of infection lies in the actual nature of COVID as described in Pfizer's vaccine trial data. If you reference their vaccine trial summary data as published on Pfizer's website and undertake some primary school arithmetic, you'll find that in the Northern Hemisphere winter of 2020, the chance of contracting symptomatic COVID was once in 410 years. 
with chances of hospitalization and or death being zero. Pfizer's entire case for the vaccine was based on 8 out of 21,500 placebo patients acquiring cold and flu symptoms over a 60-day trial period. From these data, it's reasonable to conclude that COVID, as an illness, did not and does not exist as a threat to humanity. It's also possible to extrapolate further in as much as since COVID symptoms mirror other known respiratory illnesses, flu A, B, common cold, etc., this whole debacle has been a total fraud. From this, I might reasonably infer that money and power being bestowed by the many onto the selected few in copious quantities is the true driver of the alleged pandemic. Perhaps you notice similarities with the climate cult. And that's the mailbag for this week. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy, right here on RCR. Right, that's it for The Crunch this week. It's amazing just how bad Auckland has become and how so many councillors are now prepared to be vocal. We all want our roads to be fixed, the water to be clean and on, and rubbish collected. Yet somehow the council delivers us jutter bars for pedestrian crossings, slow zones, rainbow initiatives, and argues about Maori wards, none of which we either voted for nor want. But tomorrow we'll get to the final results of the election, with the 20% of the remaining votes, the special votes, finally being counted. And there'll be a special crunch special on the specials. We'll analyse where those votes fell, what the results mean, and try and understand where to from here. Now the rubber hits the road. So let's hope the politicians respect the voting public and their wishes in forming us a new government that will start to address the ills of our society that are a legacy of the last regime. And that's why we are here at Reality Check Radio to give you all sides of any story or issue, to discuss those meaty issues, thrash them out, and it's a job we all love doing. If you're using the RCR app, and you really should be, you can easily get all our replays as well as listen live. And once again, a big thanks for the team in the back that helped put all this together and make it all work. It's been a real pleasure having you all back this week. I love your feedback. Really enjoy talking to so many people, sharing their thoughts on politics, life, and everything in between. So a massive shout out to all of you, and thank you for listening and having faith in me and RCR as we continue to explore this beautiful game of politics. Don't forget email suggestions to inbox at realitycheck.radio for people for me to interview, and let's make this show the best political show in New Zealand. Stay tuned for a breakfast show repeat coming up next with features including money talks with my mate Fazan Arani and Perigo's perspective with the one and only Lindsay Perigo. I'm looking forward to having you join me again next Thursday at 4pm for The Crunch with Cam Slater. You've been listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Remember, you can check out the replays for today's show on our website at www.realitycheck.radio forward slash replays. Tune in every Thursday at 4 p.m. for more with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio.